the show. Oh, man, it's an honor to be here with you guys. Man, the longer I'm out of the Navy, the more I crave being around brothers like y'all. So, you know, thank you so much for having me out. Ah, it's my pleasure, man. I, I, uh, so to be all, to be honest, right? So I got to, I got to put out a disclaimer before we, we kick off the show, which is, so I started following you a couple months ago on Instagram. I came across this fucking crazy ultra runner, Navy SEAL. And, uh, I can't remember what video it was or whatever. And I was like, man, I need to try to get this dude on the show. So I called Tier, uh, is uh, another SF guy that works here. Another green beret, if you will. I was like, Hey, Tier, are there any green berets that are doing anything fucking cool or what? What's going on, man? Because like, Why, just Navy the seals. seals, like, seals holy shit. Awesome. I don't know what's it's going like, on. We, got we have the corner on the market. Hey, Where's our shit? people at? Where's our people at? <laughs> where where are my pizza at? We're man? just the only ones that posted to Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is, man. <laughs> oh, I know there are tons of dudes. Uh, anyway, Tier uh, Tier's like, yeah, man, I got like fucking 10 guys in the queue. I was like, all right, well, we're good. Welcome to the show, man. I uh, We started this off with... We were talking shit earlier, probably like five minutes ago, and I paused everybody, and I was like, well, we can reconvene now. So what we were talking about was how great of a PR job the Navy has been doing for like 10 plus years, yeah, right? 10-ish years. 10-ish years. But you were saying what people see isn't necessarily the reality, something like that. I'm paraphrasing. What, what were you talking about earlier? Yeah, I'm. you know, I think Trevor was talking about kind of some of the issues they were having with some of the new guys there at SDV. Right. And um, it, it has, it seems like, so, and I, by no means am I some old school frog man like UDT guy, but, you know, I did, I did about 11 years in the Navy oh. active duty. So it really has changed a lot. From the time Trevor and I came in, man, what do we have? We had that um, documentary that Discovery Channel did. Oh, that yeah. was yeah, huge. I think two, that two, was the so single biggest. Two, three, four. Corporate. Well, it, I think that was the kickoff to all the yeah. Like, yeah. publicity. But two, three, four wasn't even. That was close enough to when we were when we got in that the repercussions weren't getting felt yet. What year we, was that? I think that was like probably 05 ish, 04 ish. I think it was because yeah, like, I knew yeah, it was like 02, 03, because I remember maybe watching 03. it in high school. Well, because when I went to STV, there was a guy there that was uh, E6. It was like a, he, he was there as an LPO that was in that class. And yeah. two, th- like, th- so that's the class number, 234. And, and I then, did the invasion of Iraq with one of those guys. Yeah. Because we had like this big soft party. <clears throat> in Kuwait before it looked like a, like a, a staging party for like cry precision or something. It was fucking so weird. But you remember the, the guy that was kind of always in trouble in that documentary. I forget his name is Travis was his name in that, but, but he was always kind of in trouble. It's kind of a troublemaker or whatever, but yeah, he was, he was on the invasion and uh, those guys were spinning up and you remember those stupid fucking doom buggies you guys used to have. Oh yeah. God. What a horrible what piece of about? shit that <laughs> yeah, they was. They, look long, cool. didn't they? they were the <laughs> dumbest vehicle ever. <laughs> like you guys had like a Volkswagen engine that never ran on the Ooh, back of that thing as but, underpowered, couldn't load it up. Anyway, all team guys are we're a bunch of freaking prima donnas, dude. So if it looks cool, but it's not actually functional, like as long as it looks cool. I mean, I'll take six of those. We got need Leopold to look sunglasses. What What do you got on? Leopold, yeah. You guys aren't sponsored by Gator or anything, are you? I mean, you talk. I'm to, not. You talk no. about Gator sunglasses. It's like, man, they look really cool. All the team guys wear them, but get them out of your freaking hot car out here. And it's like, they're not functional, burn. dude. <laughs> they burn your freaking face off. So we're yeah. prima donnas, dude. <laughs> but anyways, that's all we had, man. Was that Discovery Channel yeah. thing? And that some was pretty old, much it. Some old Dick Couch books. Yeah. You know, and so. You know, we didn't have what's it, who's Dick Couch? Sorry, he's an old team guy. Old team he guy. he, he, he published Marcinko, are you? No, no. Okay. no. Yeah, he he, he had published some some books about kind of old SEAL team mm-hmm. stuff. So you know, you could get your hands on a. So we didn't have this. I don't think that we had the all these preconceived notions and of did, what a SEAL was was right. supposed to be or supposed to do. And I did, know for me, I didn't, dude. Right. They didn't have the Manning issue where they were like, "We need team guys right now." Like. A couple of years after I got in, they started really pushing numbers. They're like, we just need to send as many humans to buds as possible. And that's what, that's what it felt like. So you were starting to catch 
a lot of guys that they were kind of feeding a story to. Well, how far apart were you guys? In, uh, class we, class? we were actually supposed to be in the same buds class. Oh, shit. So um, he you said 271, right? Yep. So that was my original class. I joined the Navy to go in. 271 was my original class. They found I had a pericardial cyst on my heart. Okay, that was in boot camp. This this story is fucking incredible, by the way, because I've already seen, I've already heard this story. So you got to tell the whole thing. Don't even, <laughs> don't, don't fucking summarize it because it's don't amazing. You dare. Oh man, yeah. And uh, so, anyways, yeah, I'm in boot camp, and like we're at the last day of boot camp where we do that big freaking yeah. battle stations thing, you know. And so we get all done last day, and all my <laughs> classmates are going to get their their navy hat. Yeah. It goes from recruit to Navy. And, and our RDC, we, that's our drill instructor, like pulls me aside and he's like, hey, man, you got to go to medical. They found something on your heart. I'm like, what the crap is this dude talking about? So I went over to medical, the dive medical officer, straight up, shows me this x-ray, chest x-ray. He's like, dude, you have a seven centimeter pericardial cyst on your heart. That's hey, a good size. Oh, it's a good that's size. like a silver dollar. Yeah, I mean, it was visible on the x-ray. It wow. was like, I could see it, and I don't know anything about x-ray. <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's, that's not what a heart's supposed to look like. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so this cat tells me this, and then he's like, but it's okay because it's asymptomatic. I've been living with this thing all my life. Right. Like, training to get ready for the Navy, like the whole nine yards. And he's like, it's cool, man. It's asymptomatic. But we're afraid when you go to death, combat diving... That the pressure change is right. going to burst the cyst on your heart. He's like, so it's all good, man. We'll send you out to the fleet, and you'll have yeah. a great career. Yeah, and I'm like, like, no. <laughs> negative. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, no, 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 no. So they send me to a dang holding unit. It's like mm. being in prison. And I literally have to call my family back home in Georgia and was like, get me out of here. Because they were just, they. I think they would have left me there. I think I could have stayed there for a year. It's like they just forgot about me. And so I, my mom called our congressman, and they did some, pulled some strings, and I got an administrative discharge, went back home to Atlanta. Shot, I, dude, I went to four different heart surgeons. Every heart surgeon said it was a rare condition, a pericardial cyst. It's the first time they had ever seen it in a Naval Special Warfare candidate. Wow. So it's very, very rare. And every heart surgeon was like, dude, we're not – we're not messing with this thing because it's asymptomatic. And right. here I am. I'm a freaking yeah. 19 year old like, kid. It's dude. elective surgery. They yeah. don't want to do it. They, they're right. not taking me seriously. Yeah. And they um, said it would explode at they didn't know. Know. They've never right. tested they, it. They just yeah. didn't know what it would do because it, they'd they never seen it and they didn't yeah. want to take a chance. Got it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I understood that. Like, I wasn't bitter. Right. I wasn't bitter about it. I was like, you know, that's cool. But I finally found a surgeon there in Atlanta named Dr. Cooper. And uh, he was actually a, a National Guard or reservist. He had deployed to Iraq and, uh, you know, worked in, as a field surgeon out there for the Army. And, um, you know, so he could appreciate the fact that I wanted to be a SEAL. And he was like, let's do this, brother. Let's, let's take this thing <laughs> off your heart. Got you, yeah, let's man. Let's do this. <laughs> so next, but, the, but the next obstacle is my family doesn't have much. Like, right. I never grew up with much. I, yeah. I still don't have much, like, from a, from a monetary standpoint. So we're like, how are we going to pay for this thing? Um, you know, and so we just decided as a family, luckily my parents are, are you know, they, they, they love me enough, and we said, hey, we're going to just pay payments on this thing for the rest of our lives. Um, so we went in, had the surgery. I remember driving to the hospital, man. I can only remember having one moment of doubt. It was getting real. They were yeah. about to go cut my chest open. And I'm like, dang. I look over at my dad. I'm like, should I do this, man? And he just looks at me and says, if you want to be a SEAL, you don't have a freaking choice, Chad. And I was just like, Roger that. And that's the way my mind works. I work on a very simple plane. It, it's either it, like it is or, or it is yeah. not. You know what right. I mean? And Kiss, so, baby. Keep it simple. That's it, man. So, yeah, we, we uh, had successful surgery. He took the thing off. The dude did his part of the surgery for free. Wow. He didn't tell us that he was going to do that. He just, um, that's the kind of guy he was, yeah, you right. know. So we ended up having to pay for the hospital bills and stuff. But yeah, I show up to the Navy How? less than a year after surgery. Wow. Okay. So less than a year. And did they have to like, 
like cut you like down the sternum on so it? So they actually went underneath my pec. So right. they they cut uh they split my broke my ribs, went in through my rib cage. They kind of peeled, detached my pec muscle and right. peeled it up and went in and had full access, I guess, to that front part of my heart where mm-hmm. the cyst was at, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a, I mean, it, it hurt when I woke up, I had chest tubes in, like it took me a while, but I was young man and, and, you know, motivated. So the hardest part was getting back swimming because you got to stretch out so long when you swim, you know, I would kept feeling it pulling my chest, but yeah, I show up in front of this dive medical officer less than a year after surgery. And uh, the dude, I never forget the look on the dude's face, you know? And he's like, what are you doing back here, man? Like, <laughs> it's like, what? what? I told you, you couldn't be a SEAL. Like, <laughs> no, man, I really wanted. I had open heart surgery <laughs> elected. Oh, man, that had to be such a great moment for you. It was like, epic, I'm man. Back. Like, <laughs> but, but even then, it was a gamble. Because even then, even though I had had the surgery, they like, they didn't me. give me any guarantee. Right. right. So I show up in front of this dude and I'm like, hey, here's the, the documents from my surgery. And and so then I had to wait like four months for him to bless. It went all the way up the chain. Oh, yeah. I mean, it went to the top, not of naval special warfare, mm-hmm. of the freaking Navy. Wow. Like the dive medical community. Yeah. And, um, you know, by, by the grace of God, man, I, I got to toe the line at SEAL training. And... uh when, so did you have to go back to basic training then and do no, that again? No, since, since I made it through the last day of boot camp, right. when I came back in, I was actually like a navet, so they treated me like a prior service guy. Got it. Um, so I did get uh, to skip that. Because they just great. did an admin set. Admin set. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And it was because the time frame was probably so short, then you weren't like outside that window, and they're like, all right, no, you're good. Yeah. yeah. Thank God I didn't have to go learn how to fold clothes again. <laughs> <laughs> Shine Brightworks. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. man. Now so. you're a you're a North Georgia guy, right? Is that where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up just out. I, I'd say about an hour and a half northwest of Atlanta. Okay, you so can never tell. that's not really a water area, if, if I'm not mistaken. What made you want to like seal, dude? Everybody asked me that question. It's that's a hard question to answer, and you're right. It's not. I, like the furthest I had swam was like across the pond to retrieve my fishing <laughs> little, and, that, and that was like a dog paddle, man. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? This is totally a common story, too. Yeah. I mean, I, like, so I lifeguarded and I grew up in L.A., like real close to the beach, and we had more than half the class that had never seen the ocean. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know what fucking job we're doing, right? Yeah, that's crazy. I am really confused. You're from Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> what is going on? Yeah. So what drove me to be a CEO, I mean... You know, I guess it was just, you know how small, I don't know if you know how small towns are in North Georgia, but there's not a ton of opportunity there to be someone special. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like you you have construction jobs, you have your, you know, just your regular kind of stuff. And I was working in construction and it just, it just wasn't cutting it for me, man. And like, so I know men that have done those jobs their whole lives, and they're some of the greatest men on earth. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, they are special men. That's why I put special in quotation marks right. if you're not watching this on video. <laughs> um, okay, so it just wasn't cutting it for me. And, um, you know, this whole Navy SEAL thing was supposedly supposed to be the hardest thing. And I guess that's what drove me, you know, yeah. to go that route. Um, yeah. That's why I can answer that. So when you so you're you you go back to go to buds, so you have you bypass basic training and you show up, you just had heart surgery a year prior. So were were you were you fit? I mean, it seems like you had to be like absolutely fit. Like what was that from what I know about open heart surgery is like, man, it's no joke. Like the mm-hmm. recovery on that is is pretty long, pretty extensive. Um, you know, even training for that, did, were you questioning whether or not you're like in good enough fitness to even go through the course once you showed up or were you like, fuck it, I already know. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. It, I mean, dude, nothing in SEAL training is that hard from a mm-hmm. fitness perspective. You got to, well, you got to run, you got to pass a four mile run, a O course, a two mile time. Dude, any one of us right now could go out and pass every single standard for buds yeah. right now. It's, it's not, not like I was, I had so much invested in 
this journey, I literally would have died before right. I quit. I don't right. say that lightly. I mean, I'm being yeah. absolutely serious. So it didn't matter. Like, I was not concerned with my fitness level. I was just like, I can do a four mile. I can do all that crap. It. It's easy day. A freaking, <clears throat> a, a dang, you know, eighth grade track student could pass the standards mm-hmm. in buds. I, I mean, it's I, the day after day. That's the hard yeah. part about buds yeah. is the it, grind, it, man. Doing it for six months and knowing that there are six months of it. Yeah. People lose their shit. They just don't want to be there anymore. They're yeah. like, you know what? I really don't want to get up tomorrow and have somebody yell at me and tell me I'm shitty at this, even though I just won. That's the biggest principle. That's the biggest takeaway from SEAL training mm-hmm. is it's the same with business. Look at the brand you've built, man. You didn't build this overnight. You, you, you've, picked these, you, you, you've picked these little small things that you could do every single day, and you focused on that and made it the best that you could possibly make that one single thing, you know, and you're able to break this massive task down into these little digestible segments. It's it's a it's a principle of nature, right? Right. Yeah. So, so you go to you know you go to buds. Did you roll any phases or you go straight through? Straight through. Yeah. Straight I through. never failed an evolution. That's great. <clears throat> Nothing, man. And so, then easy where'd day. you go? What team after that? I went to team eight mm-hmm. after that. So yeah, we had SQT obviously after buds, and right. then went to team eight, and um, I spent pretty much my whole career there. Um, did some time at Tradeet. Uh, as a, as an instructor, right? Um, really enjoyed that man. That's where I really, I really developed my love for becoming a te- like being a teacher, right? Um, that's that's like now that's my lane, man. I love teaching mm-hmm. people. Um, we we run a course in the back country in North Georgia. That's why I want to tell you this Black Rifle Coffee story. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> the the teaching part, like I love it so much, and so I said. I want to bring people out into the wilderness and teach them like solid principles from a mindset perspective and from like a a hard skills perspective. Mm -hmm. So I take them out. We do three days. Uh, We call it the basic course. What do you do? Um, We do. I mean, we start with the basics. I mean, how to filter water, Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, leave no trace principles, um, river crossing. So we hit a full, the full spectrum. That's cool. We enable these people to then go out and do their own missions. So that's my thing from a teaching perspective. I'm always trying to enable my students uh, to where I have nothing left to give them. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's I try to make it progressive to where once they leave my hands, then they become the teacher which is the most important step to becoming the master of anything. Right. You have to go through that phase of being a teacher. So we were out on the basic course the other day, and I had these little, I had the little Starbucks coffee, instant oh, yeah. coffee things, yeah. and they literally yes. taste like you filtered hot water through a freaking leather bootstrap. Oh, yeah. Like, it is awful. It's awful. But I'm, but I'm out there drinking oh, them because good. I got to have some coffee in the morning, yeah. and this chick... This chick that we, uh, this female student that we had out there, she walks up to me and she says, hey, man, you should try this. And she had a Black Rifle instant coffee packet. And I I tried it and I'm like, holy crap, this actually tastes like coffee. (laughs) So so now Black Rifle is the unofficial, official sponsor (laughs) of the basic course, man. The next day we got on Amazon and ordered like 10 boxes of Black Rifle (laughs) instant coffee. So all our students drink it now. We drink it. So it's really cool to be here with you guys after that. That was recently that that happened. You know, you guys make an awesome product, man. We spent like a year. I spent like a year on that thing. Because I, I mean... I, yeah, our first instant was, was shit. shit. It was it total was, shit. I, and it's not as if I didn't try on that one. I just, I didn't like it. It was fucking disgusting. It's, it tastes like a burnt tire. And um, this one, it's like, man, I, I got to spend more time in this. Finally punched it up. I don't know how many different versions I went through, but I mean, as a guy that spends a little bit of time in the backcountry, stuff's super important to me. Yes. And I just couldn't stomach drinking a competitor's instant, especially if you're going ultralight, like ultralight, ultralight. Like, man, you can't fucking take anything else. Like, you got to take instant. Yeah. I can't not, for me, psychologically to go, I'm not going to drink coffee. That's not, that's, it, 
it's it's like not something I really want to deal Guess with. Right. I don't really want to deal <laughs> with that. I'm, right? I'm like, ah, I'm not good. I could do it. <laughs> I just won't go. Uh, but I, I'm good. I'm gonna keep the coffee. And well, it's such a it's such a moment to to kind of forget about the other stuff that you're doing. Like that's what coffee making was for me in country. Was like that was my 15 minutes to yeah. shut everything else out. Like I had a a GSI French press yeah. and, and we had all sorts of coffee coming in. I think Seattle's best would send us like pallets of coffee. And like for those 15 minutes, it didn't matter what patrol you were going on or, you know, where you were worried about mm-hmm. getting fired from. Like it, it was the time to like really relax your mind and prepare for what was coming ahead. Yeah. So like that process to me is just important as like actually getting caffeine, you know? Agreed brother. Well, Agreed. And it works in the back country too, you know, like yeah, absolutely. You, you wake up after, say you've been hiking for a couple of days and you know, it's, it's a second or third camp and you feel kind of crappy, you know, maybe you didn't sleep that well, but you wake up and you're there with your buddy or buddies and you get to make coffee and it's like, okay, well all that crap just went away and we're getting to start another day. Yep. Like this is just okay. Hard reset. Yeah. We're good. Let's have this nice hot cup and go. That's why, especially I have such when a... you're out there with students. Like we're out there with students. So my coffee time in the morning is just like you said, brother. Yeah. It's like this is that. Don't freaking bother me. I'm not being an instructor <laughs> right now. I mean, yeah. I'm drinking I my black my own time. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's like for me, man. There's nothing. There's nothing more that that I there's that I enjoy more. Then the the bite of a morning cold, right? Just like yep. just the bite of the morning cold, steam coming off a mug, and a great cup of coffee because that signifies I'm doing something interesting. It really does, right? So it could be off the back tailgate of your truck, it could be out of your backpack or something like that. But in my house in the mornings, there's you know I'm cozy wozy at you know 70 degrees. You know I've got my pour over. There's I still like that ritual, but the ritual of seeing the steam come off that thing and hearing the fire of the stove and the whole thing is like, it's a visceral energy reaction where it's like something cool is happening today, man. We're going to get it. We're going to get it on. Like, it's going to be fun. But, you know, for me, that's just me, right? For Georgia, if you're out there with like, how many how many students do you take through this? So we only do eight per class. It's okay. very, very okay. limited, yeah. Cool. And what's it called? What's the it's, name of it? We call it the basic course. But what's the company called? So my company is called mm-hmm. 3F7 Project. Yeah. So we host it through 3F7 Project. Okay, got it. 3S? 3 of. Three so of the seven. number 3 of gotcha. the number 7, okay. yeah. Where'd that come from? So, you know... Really, what the name means is the three is representative of the body, soul, and spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, seven is the universal or or biblical number for completion. Okay. Um, okay. So we just, you know, we we talked about how do we live a more complete and wholesome lifestyle, right? And so it's really focused around master mastering, nourishing, and maintaining those three aspects of yourself mm. intentionally your body, your soul being your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your spirit being the thing that sets you apart from all other animals, whether it's a connection to God or it's the fact that you can appreciate a beautiful sunrise or sunset. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something like that. So we try to be intentional. And in all of our resources that we offer, all of our products that we offer are kind of you know, based around those three aspects and how to really achieve that complete lifestyle that's very zen i can get behind that is it is it, is, is it a survival school are you putting guys through the is it through the grind or it, is it's it, it's hard i yeah. mean it's hard but you know the first day is is heavily is like heavy instruction because we got to bring these like from the point of how to pack a, a bag right for for three or four days in the wilderness mm. people don't that's a lost art man right there's an order to that and it's an it's an immediate exercise for students we talked about breaking things down. Mm-hmm. It's that's an immediate, tangible exercise for them because here they've got this freaking gypsy camp of gear, right? And they can't figure out how to get it all in that bag. And I'm just like, hey man, take one thing in your hand, look at it, think about what's the perfect place to put that single item, place it in the bag, and then move to the next item, right? So, you know, first day's heavy instruction, second day's a big, big climb, <clears throat> and it's tough. You know, we get to the top, though. We get to a 
beautiful spot at the top. We camp. We set up camp. They learn all the stuff, man, how to cook, how to do all that. And then we have a, a like a lesson. So I'll teach that. And that'll right. revolve around kind of mindset type stuff, hashing out lessons throughout the day. Look, man, the, all these freaking master classes that are held in hotel lobbies. Yeah. And so you <laughs> right. can't freaking learn nothing there, dude. Yeah. Let me take you out somewhere where you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, be in some discomfort. Right. You're going to be uncomfortable. And so the 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 transformation that happens when I take some dude from New York out on this mission, I mean, it wrecks people, dude. They come out of there like, oh, my gosh, you know, and that's the beautiful thing about it. And, and the final the final message is that what we talked about earlier. Hey, hey, bud, I have nothing left to give you. Um you now have to go out and put this into practice and share this with other people. Right. So it's compounding. It gives us an also a really cool opportunity to partner with other people like you guys. We're using your products out mm -hmm. there. Uh, bottle Breacher, Eli Crane. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Every student gets their own Bottle Breacher. That's their, that's their thing at the end of the course, you know, right. with our logos engraved on it. So it's just a, it's a cool product, man. I think that's great. It's especially as technology gets more and more ingrained into our lives and more and more people are raised in urban areas. They, they don't really have you know, less people have an opportunity to really get out and connect with nature. And it's kind of sad in a way because like right now, <clears throat> especially with, you know, everything being so confined, like the thing I like, I dream about, like when I go to sleep at night, it's like, what do I want to do? It's like, I just think about the mountains. I just think about rivers. Like I just want to get into the wilderness so yeah. bad. And you don't get that and that desire and that, that passion to really be entrenched in the wilderness unless you do it first. Agreed. You have to get out there and do it. So if, if you're getting people from New York and, and they don't, and it's a different thing as opposed to like, you know, drive into a trailhead and then you do it on a hike and you come back. It was like, you're going out for days on end. It's a completely different experience. Yeah. And and we make it very intimate too. Like these people that apply for this course, they, they have to send me an email. Right. With summarizing who they are. Mm. And I read every one of those emails. I've read hundreds of them. Right. And I handpick you know, eight people from that stack of 200 applications. So it's very, very intimate. And I think if we ever made it, if it was ever something where it was like, oh, I think I want to be in the basic course, let me go click register. Right. First of all, I don't want some freaking weirdo coming out there with me for eight, for, you know, three days. Right. But um, yeah, it's really cool, man. I'm yeah. So, so what are you looking for there? Are you looking for, you know, someone who has zero experience or someone who just wants to try something new? Like what What kind of sticks out for you when you're making that decision? From, from an experience standpoint, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you've never hiked a day in your life. Like you have to be fit. Um, you, you don't need to be a liability. Right. You have to be fit. But what I'm looking for in an application is I'm looking for people that send in the application that is not all about themselves. Mm. I like to see people that say, I want to be a part of a team I want to be able to give to the team because we we become a team out there, right? right? I mean, just I don't have to do anything. Once once I give them the hard skills, I turn it over to them, and they they work as a as a team, almost as a platoon, you know, mm -hmm. on a on a high level, right? And um, so you know, that's the main thing I'm looking for is is people mm -hmm. that that want to give to the team, that people that want to contribute more than they just want to take. And also people that are in some sort of leadership position mm. in life or in their own community because this stuff has to compound on itself for us to make a real impact. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're really looking to cause a ripple that will that person's gonna then pass that knowledge on to someone else. Exactly. And, and man. so on and so forth. Okay. People are hungry, dude. People are so hungry right now. Yeah. For, we thought this virus stuff was gonna hurt us. Mm -hmm. It helped us. Really? People are so hungry. Yeah. Dude, we don't freaking ask. If you, we don't ask anybody. We're sleeping in tents together. And I'm not going to ask you to wear a freaking mask, dude. Right. Social distancing yeah. in the wilderness is dangerous. Yeah. It will kill you. <laughs> People are so hungry for stuff like this, yeah. dude. If you've lost hope in humanity, 
I got some good news for you. There's a bunch of people in this world that are freaking hungry to be better. Yeah. And they are good, solid Americans. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do as influencers? We have to be intentional about bringing those people together. Just like the event that you guys did the other weekend, man. Freaking awesome, dude. You're being intentional about bringing good people together. And then you don't even have to do anything at that point. You just let it roll, man. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a good, I think that's a good portion of uh, where, you know, we, we've talked about it a lot the last several weeks is the veteran community just in general, right? All of us sitting at this table, we all have our opinions on this, but you know, if you spend time and I try not to spend a lot of time on social media, I really don't like I, I tune in, I've got a time cap on my phone. I post a few things now and again, but it's full of just negative energy. The internet is just a, just a, a, a wasteland of negative energy. The veteran community, it it especially the soft community, and then when we get into like the individual segmented specialties from branches, like man, at times we just like to fucking rip each other apart. You know, the we were talking about this yesterday. There's a guy running for Congress or Senate. In, uh, in the Northeast, and he's classifying himself as a ranger. And then he had a bunch of guys online tearing him down because he wasn't in ranger regiment, but he's a ranger qualified guy. I'm like, nobody gives a shit about that stuff. Like, what are you guys doing? Hey, Amen, like, brother. Lift your fucking, lift our brothers and sisters up. Like, show how fucking incredible they're doing. Stop bickering over this little bullshit. So what if there's a veteran-owned company out there that sells fucking shirts with American flags on them? Congratulate them. Good job, you guys. And I'm not saying that even from my perspective because I hear it from guys that are like, man, my, my company just gets it on the chin for this fucking shirt that we did. And I'm like, so? What'd you do with the profit? Did you hire more people? Did you create more positive energy? Did you, did you build an ecosystem of mm. positivity? Because for this COVID thing, what it did for me more than it did, more than any other time in my adult life. What it showed me was I have three big levels of concern, right? I have myself, my family, my company, and then four would be my community, right? So if I can inject positivity and it runs through each and every one of those, and really when I look at it, I look at it like medical triage. In a time like this, when we're in this pandemic and all this fucking negative information. You don't know, you know, what the CDC director, if he's telling the truth or Fox is telling the truth or CNN or what's being politicized. It's like, you know what I can do? I can concentrate on being a good human being. Mm -hmm. I can be a good husband, a good dad. I can be the best CEO that I can be. And I can try to make a positive impact in my fucking community. It's true. But if I don't inject and mission focus on being positive you can let this shit fucking burn you down mentally. And then it goes all the way back. You can't be a positive, good force on any one of those because you're being a piece of shit. Dude, I was just talking to Tom when I was walking down the hallway. I'm like, you know what? It takes no energy not to be an asshole. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> like, none. You're Very right, true. brother. But Very you, true. You, you made some really solid points there, Evan. And it's like, like the... The first time I've ever had to wear a face covering was when I flew out here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, like, I looked over at, at Noah, and I was like, hey, man, just play the game. Just, we, it, just it's, play it the is game. what it is, man. Yeah. Just freaking play the game, you know, and, and, and do exactly what Evan just said. Be in control of what you're in control of and make an effort and be intentional. It's this right here, right? It's like this is how much I can impact, and obviously if you have a, you know, company or you got other things you can be this impact and if we focus on those things as a community and you lift each other up that was big intentional piece to this you know the total archery challenge of bringing guys out that inspire me you know the guys that are the adaptive athletes are our our friends our fucking brothers our sisters from the veteran community that have lost limbs and a sacrifice directly representing you know the, the constitution of the united states man it makes it, 
my back doesn't fucking hurt as much. I'll tell you that. When I, when I roll out of bed and I got a little twinge or a little mm-hmm. tendonitis or whatever, guess what? I got my left and my right leg and all my fucking toes. I'm pretty goddamn lucky. <laughs> Super lucky. And it puts everything, and, and, and a big portion of this is just, as veterans, we owe it to the guys that have been injured psychologically and physically. I mean, brother. We owe it to them, right? We owe it to them to pay it back. This is my soapbox, but we owe it to them. And the other piece that we owe is if we got all our fucking digits, like, man, we got to go out and try to be as epic as possible. Yep. Because if we're not, we're failing, right? We're failing our community. We're failing our community if we're not psychologically positive and injecting positivity. And it's a choice, by the way, guys. Like, it's a fucking choice, right? We all know that because I get oh, yeah. negative. There are times. No, but you remember no. that. You remember that. You guys remember that shit. Like whether it was in Hell Week or wherever the fuck. You're like, yeah. you start feeling sorry about yourself a little bit. Yeah, man. Start crawling down your little psychological <laughs> rabbit hole, and then you're like, oh wait, fuck this. Like I'm better than this. I'm not a fucking yeah. pussy. Suck it up, motherfucker. Like how many of those? I've had thousands of those conversations with myself. Oh yeah, I have had thousands of conversations with my with my individual inside my head, going, "Suck it the fuck up, like don't be a pussy." There's a huge <laughs> there's a huge weight to that. Like all of us, like we we have the gravity of knowing that our friends like didn't get to live this long. They right? didn't. So like we we have a debt. We owe it to them to ensure that we're living a good life. And it, same thing for me. It's like when, when I'm down in the dumps or, you know, I'm like complaining about something stupid or something. And like, I hear their voices and it's like, okay, so I, I can't, I can't do that. I can't live that way. Like there's too much responsibility to, to go out and have fun and live an epic, epic life and impact people in a positive way, man. Well, I, I think though, I think we owe even more than assuring that we live a good life or an epic life. Like we owe it, we owe it to them to be the standard. Mm. Like we are the standard period. I take that seriously. Every day of my life, I say, I don't care what anybody else is doing. I am the standard in whatever I'm doing, whether it's business, whether it's a podcast, it doesn't matter. That's what man, that's, we got to be the standard and like we've got that. to be like mutually supporting. Yeah, you should yeah. do a t-shirt that just says the standard on it. Yeah. That's it, brother. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole nother level. When you think about it from that perspective, it's a whole nother level. That would be like you guys saying, I don't freaking even have to look at what anybody else is doing with coffee. Right. Because we are literally the standard and no one can do what we are doing, period. And and it's absolutely true. Like we talk about that all the time. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care. And we don't even tune in at all because it doesn't really matter. Like if you see something, it's like, oh, okay, whatever. It is what it is. I think I was reading this a couple of days ago. This, this, uh, this is like a caption quote or some shit, right? Where it's like, surround yourself with millionaires and you'll be a millionaire too. Or I'm like, that's Don't such a that fucking way. dumb statement. <laughs> such a fucking dumb statement. It's surround yourself with millionaires. I know millionaires, a and a lot of those guys are fucking negative douchebag idiots that I wouldn't want to spend one second of my life around. Like, why would I give a shit about how much somebody is worth? And why would I want to be around somebody just because they're worth a million dollars? Who gives a shit? I would much rather hang with people that are good people that are worth nothing because at the end of the day, it depends, it, 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 it depends on how you're trying to define individual wealth, right? Like Trevor and I have talked about this, and I think that's one of the reasons why like, we get along and we're, you know, we're talking about Andy earlier, like Andy Stump and John and Matt and all these guys like our friends, the people that we surround ourselves with, they're just fucking cool people. Yeah. They're like out doing really cool stuff. Nobody's talking about, well, how much money did you make last week in, in the reference of like how fucking cool they are? It's like, no, man, 
did, did you get your elk tags this year? I can tell you like, exactly how many times it's come up. None. <laughs> none. Yeah. Ever. None. Yeah. None. And you guys aren't having the conversation either. It's not like, it's, it's not a dick measuring contest. It's not like, oh, how many years did you do in the military? Oh, what deployments did you go on? Like, nah. it, like that's not the way it is. Like, it's just, we're you guys are, are in all of us, we're, we're living that mutually supporting. It doesn't matter if you did freaking three years. It doesn't matter if you did 20 years. It doesn't matter what deployment. It, man, we're out here because we enjoy spending time with each other. Right. Period, you know? Well, even, uh, you know, our, one of our good friends, he's a, uh, a product designer at Sidka, uh, John. I know John. John was great. One, he was an instructor yeah. for me in Kodiak. Both of us. He called me and he's like, he called me a, a last year. It's like, hey, did, did I make 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 it clear that I wasn't a Navy SEAL on that podcast? And I was like, what? What are you talking <laughs> who about? Who freaking cares? I'm like, who you. gives a shit? <laughs> it's like, well, I just don't want to give people the impression I was a Navy SEAL. I'm like, John, you never said that once. You didn't even allude to that. You're in the Navy, bro. The Navy is a huge branch of service, and it's not just defined by one element. He's like, I know, I know, but man, I just wanted to make sure that I was really clear. I'm like, dude, you got to stop. Who cares, man? Like you did not allude to that or even say it in any regard. Like, but here's the condition, right? We as a community, we are so avid about just beating the fuck out of each You're other. right, brother. Like just right. beating the fuck out of each other where it's like, here's a dude that didn't say shit. And it's over stupid And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, I just need to make sure. I'm like, dude, do you want me to put a disclaimer at the front of it? It's like, John Barklow, not, not a Navy SEAL. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. FYI, awesome guy and better than a bunch of Navy SEALs that I know. So, yeah, hey, man. That, that, so there, that lends to your point, man. Now, like, yeah. There's a perfect example. Like A guy like that, should, that should never even cross his mind. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? Just talk about That dude service. taught me. He taught me. <laughs> yeah. Like A lot of the stuff I teach at the basic course, John taught me. Really? Yeah, and he wasn't a SEAL, and he doesn't have to be a SEAL. That makes no freaking difference at all. No. You I know? Mean, some of the best dudes I know, I obviously, I mean, in, you know, not to go on the <laughs> word never seals, but it's like, man, just because you have a long tab or a short tab or a trident, two that, deployments, six that deployments, that doesn't make you a, a good person either. That's not a qualifier to make you a good person. I know a few guys in Leavenworth, I think, I think Andy have tabs, and I think, I think Andy said it. Somebody asked him, you know, like, hey, you know, why aren't you supporting me? Or, you know, why don't you? Just carte blanche support all team guys. He goes, Dude, just because you have a trident doesn't mean you're not an asshole. Yeah. Like, it doesn't mean I'm going to like you or that we're going to be friends or that I trust you. That's absolutely true. Like, and it, it bodes the same everywhere from a grunt nobody in any branch all the way to a freaking CAG guy. Like, I don't care what you did. That doesn't mean you're a good person. No. And mean. <laughs> that matters far more because. Dude, if you live to be 90, you know, you spend a decade in the military, that's a blink of an eye. Like 10% of your time, like, you know, if you do that over a college career, all right, cool. Two months. Who's going to remember two months of their college, their entire time in college? I don't know. You know, just start yeah. boiling that stuff down into, into chunks that people can understand. Like, I, who, who gives a shit? Like, yeah. make something with it. I just had a good buddy of mine on my podcast, man, that uh, we went through first phase together and he ended up <laughs> quitting. And it's ate him alive his whole life. I haven't seen him in over a decade. He came out to my house and it's just ate him alive, man. Really? And we had to have this conversation that right. we're all having right now. And, and, and he brought up the point that like, man, I just, as a man, I just want to go and be tested in battle. Like, I just want to go to war, man. Like, I, I want to test myself on that level. And I think a lot of people look at, if, if they had that opportunity to go to battle and test themselves, that they would all of a sudden experience some satisfaction, some level of satisfaction that, that they've never experienced in life as a man. Yeah. And, and I'm, like, I'm like, no, man. Like, do you understand? I, I know men that have done 15 deployments, and, and guess what? They're not satisfied. No. They want one. They just want one more. One they more. just want one more. It's like, so he's trying to seek this satisfaction in something like war, 
which war is for the most part illogical and stupid. <laughs> yes. Um, so you're trying to seek satisfaction in something in life that's illogical and stupid. It doesn't exist. Like X that out of your brain, dude. Yeah. This dude's going to school right now to be a um if somebody studies rockets. Um, a freaking rocket scientist. Rocket scientist. <laughs> or and I, I'm like, dude, <laughs> here you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, dude, you're still bent out of shape that you're that you didn't make it through buds, and you're going to school to be a rocket scientist. Like, dude, do what you do, brother. You know? Well, it's so true, man. Like, I don't know how many guys, you know, either whether it was guys that I, I grew up with or went to school with or whomever it is, and it's like they they look at that and they're like, man, I really wish I would have had that experience. And I, it's the same thing. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah, you don't wish you had that experience. Like, it, one, I was like, yeah. it, you have it for the rest of your life, by the way. It's it's like a fucking virus that continues yeah. to stay oh with you. Gosh, like, you don't can. get rid of it. Yeah. I'll never not so remember this. why do you stuff. want, like, you don't want it. Like, and, that, and that's not even me being a tough guy. That's just me saying, like, hey, dude, like, if I could get a fucking eight-hour block of sleep at night, like, no shit. It'd be really cool. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> I would love to get fucking eight hours straight sleep, man. I would love to fucking, you know, not have like my default emotions being fucking anger and spend my entire adult life like, you know, wondering, you know, whether or not I'm going to have the capacity to fucking love my children or weird shit, right? Where it's like, fuck, dude, it's not a great fucking thing. When you, when you boil it down, it's like, man, you don't want this. Like, you don't want it. I get these questions a lot where I'm like... I have a huge backlog of really great memories of guys that... St- are dead. Yeah, they're dead. That's that's fantastic. And that's not like, you know, we can bust out the viol- violins. That's just the reality, just reality where it's like, you know, being proven in combat does not give <clears throat> you some form of nirvana, right? And I think a lot of guys think that's it's going to give it to you like, oh, that's nirvana. No, it's not. It's actually it's especially if you use it as a as an obstacle to continue to overcome for the rest of your fucking life, that's the only way you can improve yourself. Like I have this incredible gift which is cursed where you're like man i gotta fucking work on this shit every day for the rest of my life and that's the reality of it is it doesn't go away you gotta work on it for the rest of your fucking life and you gotta work especially if you've done a a long time on the fucking trail you gotta work it's a long rough road of fucking work and you know, and I know a lot of guys deal with way more than we do, right? Like, we're oh, yeah, man. Way more. Yeah. And I think if people just understood, like, man, this isn't getting, and I think the, the movies themselves, right? They glorify it. They give you an unrealistic perspective as to how fucking glorious and wonderful it is. It's like, fuck, dude, it is not like this. I don't, dude, this ain't fucking die hard, man. Like, yeah. you're not going to be a fucking hero walking around with no shoes on in a, in a fucking tower. What? Which is a diehard reference on top of very serious conversation. But <laughs> Look, I, not can tell me. Remember it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I now I'm just kind of wandering around in this. Well, conversation, I mean, I think I think you know it is a weird conversation to have. It's uh, a weird conversation. I, I think that there's some value there, though. I mean, you you look at you know men and women that may listen to this. It's like you know just freaking get that out of your head and and freaking do live life, man. Like. You know, I don't know, man. So yeah, hopefully somebody gets some value out of it. It's a weird conversation. It's a it's a bullet point on the resume. Like, it's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough. Like, you, you can't just be like, well, I served in the military. Like, throw your hands up. Like, there's my life. Like, you got to do more. You got to do more. It can't be the thing. Well, and but I think, I think my point in this is like combat itself, because a lot of people think just going to combat is, is, is like, it, it's going to make them something, right? It's going to make them somebody different, which inherently is saying like, are, you're not good enough, right? Yeah. So you're automatically defaulting to this, I'm not good enough type of mentality. Whereas, you know, the thing that I would say, the benefits to it, I'm not dissuading service whatsoever because I think service to the country is is an incredible honor. And, but I know a ton of guys that were, that never, got rotated in the box, for instance, right? And they're like, man, sometimes I never fucking I didn't get it. And it's like, sometimes it doesn't happen, yeah. right? But it does, it, 
It does give you a sense of freedom. So I'm going to contradict myself to a certain degree. It does give you a sense of freedom in a way where it's like, I got nothing else to prove in my life. You know what I mean? Like I was, I was having this conversation with a buddy of mine. He was like, I was like, yeah, I was trying to bake scones the other day. And he looked at me. He's like, you're baking scones? <laughs> I was like, yeah, man. Did like, I stutter? I was like, dude, I can bake scones in my kitchen in fucking high heels while sucking two dicks. It's not going to be any different. I'm a Green Beret that spent nine years in the CIA. I'm about it. I've checked all my fucking boxes. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, okay, that's fair. I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Right? But it's, it does give you a sense of freedom because you're like, man, I, I don't need that. I don't, I don't need it. We can say this from the table and say, I don't need it. And I can give the valuable. I can wear a fanny pack flip flops. I can wear a flint. Yeah. Look at Logan. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Bo Skinner. Look at Bo Skinner. <laughs> he doesn't Bo care dude. at all. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a good point, Evan. I think, but I think there are other there are other paths to that to that type of freedom. You know what I mean? The the, the path that we've taken is is one, and I agree with you hundred percent. You know, I feel the same way about myself. It's like I don't owe anybody anything, and you know, my whole mantra is um, be hard when it gets hard. Right. In, in other words, we've got that place like forged inside of us. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we want to bake scones in the kitchen, or you know, when you're home, dude. You can turn it off and you don't have to feel like a pussy about it. You know <laughs> you what I mean? Don't. It's like, so. You really don't. And I think, you know, for a lot of the community, when they look at these things, you know, and they start to look at each one of their, like I was in regiment or I was in SF mm-hmm. or I was in the SEAL teams. I think part of that too is, you know, they're protecting, they're protecting the unit, right? When we we're talking about being negative towards each other, but protecting the unit like protecting the regiment, protecting the honor uh, and the integrity of your service doesn't mean like calling everybody on the fucking internet a shit bag all the time, right? It's like that's that's not protecting the integrity of any unit, of any form of service, unless it's, you know, stolen valor. Just makes you look mm-hmm. like an asshole. Just makes you look like an asshole. And that's one thing when I when I started tuning into, you know, like your social media, I was like, oh man, this guy's like positive he's fucking like the ultra running thing i thought was super cool for a combination of reasons uh because i i i i love to think of myself as a runner but i'm not Hmm. right um and i i think it's fucking fascinating that people are running these types of distances uh and you know you're obviously like former tactical background now you're teaching and now you're running this seems to be a pretty big part of your life as far as the running is concerned like like where where did that come from have you always wanted to do this and this sounds like a a weird question for this but it's like man get me into where the running came from and and what's going on like what are you trying to do with it i think there's a there's multiple layers to ultra running for me i think um one thing for me personally, uh, when I got, you know, done with the military, I was medically retired in January 2019, so I haven't been out that long. You haven't been out at all. Um, yeah. Like- so life is new to me, but you know, I ha- I have to have something in my life per- personally that's going to test me on a high level. Right. Um, I also think that it's important for me in the position that I'm in. Um, I've got a somewhat of a, a small social media following and, uh, I have, I take, I, I see that as a responsibility. So if I can post something on social media and reach a hundred thousand people, that's a freaking responsibility, man. Right. And so I feel responsible <clears throat> to keep myself on the freaking same ground level as everybody else. So ultra running is something that will tear you down, brother. Yeah. Like it will tear you down to the most basic person that you, you know, to the primal state. Um, so ultra running, I think, helps keep me like on the ground level with everybody else uh, from a mindset standpoint too. You know, you, you've got a lot of, you got a lot of guys out there that got out of the military. They got five good stories. Yeah. They tell those five good stories a hundred times and like that that's it for them you know what i mean well ultra running is a is a way for me to continue to create stories to continue to put the principles that i teach 
into practice, right? Practice what I preach, to, to be a leader by example. It's, it's the conduit for all of that, really, uh, is what ultra running is. I, I win a lot of races. I don't care. I, I go there and I win just because I'm not going to go to a race and not try to win. Right. That's just how I am. It, but, but the actual win means nothing to me. Uh, mm. You know, I've done, I don't know how many uh, hundred mile races, you know, you get these big, beautiful buckles, belt buckles after a hundred yeah. mile race. I give all my belt buckles to whoever crews me for that race. Right. So I don't have a single keepsake from any of these wow. <clears throat> races because that's not what it is for me, man. The, um, the path is the end. Like, that's what you want. You want, yeah. you want what you're learning through the training. You want yeah. what you're learning through the participation. Did you start when you were in the Navy? Did you start running this? When when they told me that I was likely going to be medically retired, that's yeah. when I looked at a 50-mile race. Right. And uh, I ran that race uh, probably about eight months before I got out. Uh-huh. And um, <laughs> That's so funny. I'm going to be medically retired, so I'm going to do a double marathon. <laughs> you can see uh, I love that mentality, man. Like the, That just will, sheer willpower to just push past something like not be labeled by anything you know yeah brother and it's it's uh another thing i like to surround myself with winners like why in society is it not okay to be a winner anymore like Mm. i like to surround myself with winners (laughs) that's woke. (laughs) that's like woke cancel culture propaganda bullshit there you go man is, right? no, are you not <laughs> participating like... in the wokeness on <laughs> <laughs> no it's just <laughs> and, and you have a lot of winners in ultra running i mean not those not, guys are winners like just like the fucking perpetual 100 winners. miles like fuck it man like you're doing 100 miles or 50 like yeah. you're a winner you finished holy fuck i'm going amazing. for a run tuesday Oh, you're going to be running on Tuesday? No, no, no. All, All of Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, yeah, you misheard me. When I finish a 100-mile race, you know, I, I will sit at the finish line until sometimes until the last person comes wow. through. And that may be eight hours right. after I'm done. Yeah, yeah. But that freaking dude that comes in last place was out there grinding Eight longer. hours longer than <laughs> I was. Yeah. So like that much harder. Like, man, you know, it's like you said to your point. Um, you, if you if you run a hundred miler and you finish and you finish strong, you're not you're not the guy that's out there feeling sorry for himself and just moping around. But you finish strong. It doesn't matter where you finish. Right. You're a freaking winner, dude. Like, if you run if you run the Western states. Have you run that one? I have it. Yeah. I, so I like to run on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, I, I love the, I, not that I don't love these mountains. I spent all day in these mountains <laughs> yesterday. Uh, we bagged Lone Peak. That was an awesome mission. Um, but East Coast, I love the culture. Um, it's really, really grassroots. It's guys like us, long hair, beards, don't freaking care. We drink beer and coffee. Right. Um you know, we're, we're not vegan. West so do you Coast, see? Do you see that change? Or? West Coast's a little more granola and international. You, you really yeah. do, man. Really? It's 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 a different. It is a different culture, and, and not look. I'm not putting them down. I mean, those those Western states and stuff are huge races, right. and they draw out a lot of competition. Yeah, but man, you know, the East Coast race, races are just down and dirty. Dude. <laughs> I mean, and well, I, I love that. Well, I think that's because remember I was talking to you when we first got in. I was like, man, most of the ultra runners that I've run into, and I had a place just outside of Boulder, Colorado for a long time. So most of those dudes, they are, they're not chewing Copenhagen. That's for sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, it freaks people out. They're, they're like vegan. You, you know, I mean, we know the model. I'm just trying to search for the right words where it's, it's like, most of these guys are super cool. I've never met guys that are complete assholes, to be honest with you, but they're not chewing Copenhagen and eating fucking steaks. You know what I mean? They're they're really concentrated on every little detailed aspect and then what it is that they're doing in the sense of like, but then we meet guys like Matt Frazier and you. Matt Frazier is the fittest man on earth, supposedly, right? Yeah. CrossFit games multiple times. That's what his shirt says. First time I met him, got in the back of the Tundra, we we're driving out to the range, took out a can of Copenhagen. So I don't know. <laughs> Dude. I don't know, man. Like he's like, I was like, how'd you win? What was your diet like, Matt? When you when you won the first CrossFit James? He's like, he's like, 
I was eating out of a, a food truck at the university. I was eating these fast Chinese food. Well, so it was it? I didn't care what macros or micros. I, dude, I didn't even know what they were. I didn't know what macros and micros were. I was just there to fucking crush people. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. I'm I freaking love lots that. of food. What, dude, when I run by people with, with a dip with a dip a fat dip of Copenhagen in, and I'm like 90 miles deep into yeah. a run, and I run, I'll run by these cats, and first of all, they don't even freaking know what dip is. No, but they see me throw a dip in, and then they're like. Is that even allowed? That must be performance enhancing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm like, do I'm you like, want to try it's it? It's exactly yeah. the opposite. Yeah. It's raising my heart rate. And it dehydrates me. Yeah. So it's making Look, like, man, I'm taking this to give you a chance. It <laughs> freaks people out, man. They just freaking can't wrap their mind around it. But it just goes to show, like, dude, my average training week is like 30 miles, man. Seriously? It's like it's oh. like 30 miles, dude. Um, but you know, we've been, we've all been doing hard stuff for decades. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you know, it's so much what's up here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can go win a hundred mile race on an average 30 mile training weeks for months uh, prior. And it is what it is, you know? That's fucking crazy. I'm curious me. what, uh, getting a little bit more into your training regimen in the, the 30 mile weeks and stuff like, <clears throat> not that I'm comparing this to what you do at all but when i was trained for a marathon it was like a you know speed work one mm -hmm. day where you're running a pretty short distance and trying to just increase your cadence and then like a medium run and then a, and a long run and then the long run is is what you increase with every ongoing week to get closer and closer to is, that, is do you have a regiment like that where you're doing different various things or is it kind of just whatever you feel like yeah it's a absolutely no structure seriously yeah. it's whatever i feel like doing but now i i will preface that with saying i do hard stuff right like so yesterday for instance we went from basically sea level we woke up at 3 a.m right got on the airplane at 6 a.m Went from sea level to here, drove straight to the base of the Wasatch Range, climbed to 11,250 feet, right. the top of Lone Peak, came back down, took a wrong turn, ran out of water, had zero water for over four hours, completely exposed. I'm a freaking pasty white dude, <laughs> sunburned like to the bone, like no water, like, like, so we do hard, like, Right. Like we were following a compass bearing down a ridge on this range, on this mountain range over here yeah. to get back down into the valley because we had hit this dang trail that be all of a sudden disappeared. <laughs> and I followed freaking mule deer trails out of there <laughs> yeah. on and off game trails for like three straight hours, dude. So we do hard stuff. Like we put, I put, I intentionally put myself in situations on a regular basis that are way harder than like somebody that follows a structured, it's not good to dehydrate yourself. Right. Right. You that, know, that's hyper interesting, man. It, it almost sounds like you're, you're training mentally more than you are physically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, and you're also doing things like, you know, we might go out for, we might go out for a 40 mile training run and not carry any food. Right. on purpose right because it's like your body will make adaptations yeah so yesterday i went four hours in 100 degree heat totally exposed with no water guess what next time i'm in that situation or from this point forward my body's going to be a little yeah. bit more efficient about mm -hmm. how it uses the water that i put into it right and then it also reminded me of what it was like to feel really really thirsty Right. Um, you know, I was to the point that I could barely talk because my tongue was stuck to the, it was like Sears wow. school thirsty, man. You know <laughs> what I mean? So it's, those are all good reminders, man. It's, but it's very, not, my training is very non traditional. I love bushwhacking, dude. Like I love land nav. Um, I love all that stuff. So, and the, the miles that I do run are primarily like slower pace, but hard miles. What's man. a slow pace, you think? Like, what are you putting in um, for intentional training? Yeah. The, the, the terrain really dictates it yeah. heavily. On flat terrain, I'm really comfortable at an eight-minute mile. Mm -hmm. um, in the mountains, like r serious mountains, I'm, if I can average three miles per hour, I'm good. Right. I'm happy with that. Yeah. You know, it's constant forward motion. Mm -hmm. Like right. a hard hike. Yeah, like a hard hike. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. 
is when you start stopping and starting and stopping and starting, that's when you, you're not, you're not going to win that way. But if you can just freaking, like Mid-State Mile, dude, that was a one-mile loop every 20 minutes. I did that for 30 straight hours. Wow. Every 20 minutes, I did a one-mile loop that had 350 feet of eleva- elevation gain and loss. Oh, wow. So after 30 hours, that totaled up to be like 33 or 35,000 feet of elevation gain, higher than Everest. Yeah. Um, but it was just, it was literally because I, I, I never stopped. You yeah. know, it wasn't that I was fast. I just never stopped. That that those type of races are tailor made for me because I'm not the fastest. Right. I'm not the strongest, but I'm just a little bit tougher than you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's all it takes. Yeah, yeah. There was a guy at Mid State. The guy. It came down to me and one other guy. He was on the um, the national ultra running team, the American national ultra running team. I didn't think I could beat this dude. That didn't matter to me. Right. But there was a distinct moment when I knew I was going to beat him. We, uh, we came in after our one mile. If you finish the mile in like 18 minutes, you could refuel for like two minutes, right? <laughs> Got it. So the dude walks up to me and he's like, he's like, Chad, we've got six hours till we hit 100 miles. Boom. I knew I was going to beat him in that moment because he was no longer focused on the one mile that we had to run in that next 20 minutes. He, I knew he was overextending himself uh, mentally. Right. And it swallowed him up, dude. Yeah. It swallowed him up. Well, it's funny because that I think that mental state like transfers to you physically. Like when you're looking at the finish line and you're not looking at the mile, like I think there's oh, actually something physical that happens to you. A hundred percent, brother. A hundred percent, man. Guess what happened when he overextended himself? He literally, his leg, I've never seen anything like this. This joker's legs, quads, like completely Just, locked up. And he literally comes, this dude was tough. I'm talking about this dude was tough. This dude, if we did that same race tomorrow, he's liable to beat me. Right. He ain't got no quit in him. When it, <laughs> com- when it comes down to, two, to, to, to the top two, right. like we're equal. But as soon as he overextended himself, that physical response happened. His quads locked up. He literally collapsed. This dude could not walk. Like, the videos on Instagram. I, When that happened, I had battled against that man for so long, and I had so much respect for him. When that happened, I could not look at him without starting to cry. Wow. It was so powerful, man. We don't see that in society a lot right. anymore. You know, what? You we, we see that in battle maybe, um, but not in everyday life. Yeah. And um, I went back to the Seal Creed where it says, what sets me apart is my ability to control my emotions regardless of circumstance. Mm. And I'm looking at this dude and like, no, Ken, I, like the... It's just welling up in me. But I'm like, I cannot show this emotion right now because I still have to perform. Like, I I know he hasn't quit yet. Right. But this Joker's liable to bounce back. I mean, he's a beast. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, And I'm like, I cannot let that happen. And so I just hit him on the shoulder. I was like, Greg, I can't, I can't talk to you right now, man. I just gotta run. And he he understood that because he's a warrior too. In a different sense. He hasn't yeah. been to war. Right. But on the battlefield of life, he's a warrior too. And he understood that. And uh yeah, that was his last lap. But it was a powerful it was a powerful moment that I was able to incorporate again the lessons that we all know as men, that ability to control your emotions. How you know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity, you know, in a real way. Yeah, that was a very similar lesson I got very, very early on from a senior and it, it wasn't directed towards me, but we were doing a, a 20 miler or something like that. And, uh, one of my peers started complaining like, Oh, I don't know how I'm going to make it to the end. And he's like, don't think about that. He's like, take a step and ask yourself, am I okay right now? Take another step. Am I okay right now? The answer is going to be yes. If you're not focused on the, 
on the finish or, you know, what time you're going to be done. And I was like, oh, that's such a good point because so much of it being successful is like, like being present in the current moment. Oh, man. I mean, so whether true. you're running a race or not. So true. There's three principles that boil down from that race. Patience. Patience was, was huge. And patience is, is part of that being able to break it down, being able to stay present, um, that whole deal. You have to be patient to continuously run right. for uh, for that long. Um, so it was patience, and dang, I forgot the other one. I had it listed out. But the last one was uh, was function check. You, you, said, you, you said, think about, okay, what am I doing now and how do I feel right now? That was, for me, I call that a function check. Mm-hmm. It's just like we do with our weapons, right? And right. I would do that every loop. I'd go from head to toe, man. Each muscle group, boom, boom, boom. If something was a little out of whack, I would adjust my stride or I would adjust something in order to compensate for that. And um, so I was really intentional about checking back in with myself. And that's a big part of being present. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, do you have anything with you? Are you running with... Do you run with music? Do you run with books? Do you run with anything? Or is it just no electronics? I'm I'm out there. Like you're just in your own head. When I'm racing, uh, I'm just in my own head. Yeah. Now, if I'm out training, I mean, I love podcasts, man. Yeah. I mean, I've been listening to this show for like since you hit me up, Evan. Right. You know, I've been listening to you guys a lot out on my run. Um, but I like it to be kind of mindless. Uh, not mindless, but I like it to be con- just conversational. You know what I mean? Like, that's what the kind of podcast sure. I like to listen to out there, you know. And so that's about it. No music, nothing like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, like yesterday, you know, if I'm in a, doing a, like a legit mission where you have to be locked on. Right. Like yesterday at Lone Peak, dude, it's hairy up there. If you, haven't, really? if you haven't been, no, you need to it. go. Okay. Because it's literally like each step for the last – Hundred yards, your life depends on each step. Seriously, you've got wow. a sh- you've got a sheer what do you say thousand foot drop? You've got a sheer thousand foot drop on both sides of you. You're climbing over a boulder the size of a Toyota truck, and if you are not locked on, you will die. <laughs> <laughs> you will not slip and break your leg. You will die. Right. You and will die. One hundred percent. No yeah. question about it. And so, like those missions, man, I'm locked on. You know, yeah. nothing, dude. It's just, you know, that's why I kept telling Noah. I was like, got to be tight right here, man. We got to be tight. And that, that again, talk about staying on that ground level. That was a place where we intentionally put ourselves in the position where we had to control fear. Fear is an emotion. We had to control that fear. If you take somebody up there that's not efficient at controlling fear, you would get them to the top and they would lock up completely. And and me, I've done a lot of crazy stuff, dude. We've all jumped out of airplanes. We've all dove. We've all done all this crazy stuff, but I still experience fear. It's just that I can control it a little bit better than most people and continue to press forward and accomplish my mission. You have to practice you that. You have to practice that. I, and it doesn't stop after service. No, I, I think that, I, I I don't know if it's necessarily a huge perishable thing, but I remember very, very acutely back in like 2000, we were, I was going through the basic non-commissioned officers course, which is like, you know, something you have to go through when you're becoming an E6. And I was having this conversation with my instructor, who's a great guy. We became fucking great friends. We're still friends, still text each other. And we were talking about whitewater kayaking. And he was like, what do you, what's this whitewater kayaking thing, man? Why do you do that? And it's like, man, honestly, like it scares the shit out of me. And I do it because it's fucking scary. That's awesome, <laughs> and he's man. like, really? That's awesome. He's just kind of like, what? You know? And I was like, no, man, like, you have to be single point focused on what you're doing. Like you got to, you got to run your line. The only thing you can think about is putting your paddle in at the right, at the right place at the right time with the right power to go up and over and in through the fucking rapids. And if you don't do something right, there are going to be drastic consequences in water. As we, as you guys know, water will fuck you up. Water like, don't care. Water don't care. <laughs> it's an equalizer. It's an equalizer, right? So 
when I kind of explained it to him, he's like, well, do you just love, you know, kayaking and rafting? I was like, I do, but what I really like about it is it forces me to focus on the task at hand. And I don't have combat, right? This is 2000. I was like, there's no combat at hand right now. But I feel like these types of tasks, high-paced, very intense, very reactive, will help me prepare for if we ever have to go to combat. That was a very, very intentional thing for me was to do something scary, very high-paced, and you don't get to dictate necessarily where the river takes you at times, right? So you don't, you're not in charge of this entire thing either. Climbing's different. Because in climbing, you you know you can carve through the rocks and you can put your pro in different areas. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I just know that where whitewater kayaking was concerned was I wasn't very good. Water's really fucking cold. It can be really scary, especially when you get up into like class four and it just comes at you and you can't get out of the fucking water either. Yep. Like, it's not like you can go, oh shit, I'm tired of this. <laughs> yeah. Right in the middle, oh man, I'm going to turn around. You know what? Never no, you're mind. Not, you're not going to turn around. Bet, you're going to go, whether you like it or not, motherfucker, you are in this and you're going to, you're going to, the river will take you to the end, whether it's at the bottom or whether it's all the way through. And it was interesting because he had told me later, he's like, man, I start, you give me this fucking white water kayaking speech, man. It's like, I got to try this shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, brother. Yeah, it's those, it's those moments when time almost seems to slow down. Like when, when chaos is all around you. It, <clears throat> it's happened to me. I remember getting shot at and everything slowed down and... And then you like, you understand that like, okay, even though you're not in control, same thing with water, like you can't control that thing. You have to accept it. But having those, like getting in those places when you feel like you're, you're in like a funnel, like you're, you're in everything that you're doing at that moment. You, once you do that a couple of times, you almost seem to develop this confidence for the unknown. Yeah. And that is the, such a valuable thing. It almost like relaxes me saying that aloud because it's like we have no idea what life is going to throw at us. You know, life is like a river. Like it's it's going to keep flowing. You can't slow it down. Yeah. You know, when you're climbing, you can pause and shake your arm. You're like you can't do that in a river. You can't do that in life. Well, there are times when it's slow, right? You can slow it down. You can, you know, take a little bit of a pause, but it's like that, you know, keep coming back to that river analogy where, you know, for us, you know, at least, you know, for me and that experience and being able to train for fear, like being able to train for fear is so fucking important. Yeah. Psychologically. And it's interesting because now at, you know, 43, um, and I was, I was explaining this to my wife probably several years ago because she was like, what, you know, what do you do on these, you know, on your daily cadence? I was like, and I've heard other people talk about it on other podcasts and they're like writing books about it and making fucking, you know, good for them. They, they make a bunch of money doing it, but it's like, you have to build confidence targets and build those things into your repetition of life where you're like, this was fucking hard psychologically difficult it scares the shit out of me but if you're never if you're never like pushing the boundaries on that and scaring yourself a little bit in a controlled circumstance mm -hmm. you won't be capable you know I, and I, I talked about this in a lot of the courses i used to teach it's not you can't if you've if you've never exemplified courage in your life up to the point where you need to step out of a fucking car and pull the trigger on somebody that's shooting on shooting at you, you will not be capable of doing it then. So in every aspect of your life, if you're not the guy that can have a candid, hard conversation with somebody, right? You know, with somebody that you love, where there are consequences, if you, you know, if you're not pushing the limits of your daily life, you will not be psychologically capable of stepping up when things really fucking matter because you've had a fucking easy peasy, you know, you've avoided it the rest of your life. You're going to fucking fold. You're going to collapse in a fucking pile of, you know, wet mess and you won't be capable. And I think 
now is a great opportunity for people today in America where it's like, man, you see all, like all of us. And I see my veteran community right now, man, they're, they're thriving in this, right? It's yeah. not, they're, they're not capitalizing on negativity. They're not doing that. Their guys are like, fuck man, this is an old shoe. Chaos, bitch, I'm used to this shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like you were saying, Chad, with the guy you were running with who you saw him, you know, or he reached that point. And I know you've talked about this as well, Evan, to where you're like, if you see somebody kind of cashing their chips and you're like, Oh, I'm doing okay. Like you, it adds another layer Power. for you. Like you, you get uplifted oh, 100%, seeing really. other people like call, call it like, you're like, Oh no, I'm yeah. okay. I'm going to keep going. And now it's like fun. Other people are starting to drop off. And I that's call just that like, the vampire effect. <laughs> <laughs> where, you take, where you take the other person, the, qu- the quitter's energy, and you absorb that into yourself. There you go, brother. <laughs> Evan, you hit on a really good point, man, in your talk. You talked about the books and the, the all the online resources that are out here to kind of teach you this stuff. First of all, I don't even know what's up with the freaking books, man. What everybody has written, I can't, dude. I bet I get ten requests a day for people ask me to write a book, and I'm like, you know when I'm going to write a book? When I'm 80 years old and I right. can't freaking move, and I'm like, all right, it's time to, to like write these stories out. <laughs> like I feel like you should never get to see your own book become popular because that's something you do at the end of the journey. <laughs> but there's so many books out there. There's so the the, the um you know all the online resources and master classes like okay that's all great right yeah but that's that's just a starting point like you can't stop with that you can't think that you can read this dang book or take this dang online course and think that you just got it all man you got to go put it into practice you know that's that is the most essential yeah. part of it so Stop buying all these freaking books and spend your money to buy a plane ticket to Salt Lake City and go climb up Lone Peak. And if you die, you die. But just go on up there. Yeah. Train a little bit first. Yeah. Get, get, <laughs> you train yourself, a little bit. get yourself ready, <laughs> but go and do it, man. Execute. Execute. Right? I think yeah. I think that's fucking spot on. Like I, I I talked about this a lot, my courses, where it's like wisdom right so if you're actively seeking wisdom you can't and and it's it's a several pillared chair if you look at it or it's got several legs to it in the sense of you have to have some type of education in what you're doing you have to have the communication procedures right so you have to be communicative in this because wisdom to yourself is truly just internalized. It's not shared with your community and it's worth basically nothing, right? So if you have your formal education, you've got solid communication skills and the experience, then you add all of that with a dab of fucking intelligence, be able to die, essentially put all this stuff together. Just need a dab. It's need a dab. Yep. You don't need a lot because all go. that shit actually works in combination with one another. Yeah. And I think a lot of people they they get wrapped around I got to take this fucking course and I mean in business I hear this all the time where that guy's got an MBA and it's like you know how many idiots I have met with fucking business degrees. You know how easy it is to start a business today and learn all the things that you'll need to learn about business on fucking YouTube and running a business. When I say that, it's never been easier in literally the history of commerce to start a fucking business than it is today. It's never been easier, right? You don't, you know, Wake Forest, Stanford, or Harvard is not going to give you the keys to the fucking castle in order to go out and be successful. It's not going to happen. And I think a lot of people, they want, I wouldn't say it's not, it's not a shortcut necessarily, but they think, well, as long as I have this education, right, I'm no. going to be able to do it. And it's like, no, you still got to execute. You know what they want, Evan? They want to be told what to do. Yeah. They want to be told what to do. If I've learned anything in business, and by no means am I a huge businessman, but I run a freaking business, 
I learned this lesson a long time ago in the SEAL teams, is that no one is going to tell you what to do. In business, if you want to start a freaking business, if you have an idea for a product, you have to just, just launch it, dude. Don't wait for somebody to freaking tell you what to do. Like you said, there's no key. There's, there's no magic dust. There's no right or wrong answer. Just freaking do it, man. But look at society today, man. People want to be told what to do. They want to yeah. be taken care of. They would rather have a freaking handout mm -hmm. than figure it out on their own. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's, I think it's pretty obvious to to see the problem, and you know, you could look at a couple things with the onset of the vlogging type content, or with something like Twitch. Like it blows my mind the amount of people that will sit and watch other people play video games for like a really extended unbelievable of time. It, it blows my mind. I'm like, why wouldn't you just want to play? Why wouldn't right. you want to go play it? Or watching a, a vlog type piece of content in some of these, you know, where you're consuming said person's content, you know, and you're putting hours in over the course of a couple of months watching their life. It's like, why don't you want to go live? Why don't you want to go do that stuff? It doesn't make any sense to me. Look, I sold a product the other day. About a month ago, I sold a product to 2,000 people that didn't even exist. I, create, I created the product after I sold it. It was an idea. Right. And I knew that I would take the initiative to figure out how to do it along the way. Like, what was it? I, it's, I, I, know, I know that I'm going to figure it out. I don't want you to tell me what to do. You well, know what I mean? What was it? Can you, can you tell us? Uh, no? It, well, it's, <laughs> it, what, what it is, it's, it's, a, it's basically a program and I've I've got some partners on it. Right. Um. One a good friend of mine named Jesse Itzler, um, he's he's probably one of the best entrepreneurs in the nation. I mean, this guy is a freaking genius. But we're good friends. We run together. You know, we do business together. Um, we just mesh really well. And we put together a program that was kind of a spinoff of the Mid-State Mile Race. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of energy around that. People that were they they got really when they saw what happened out there they got really really hungry to get a little bit better right and so we created a program that basically challenges individuals to to be more excellent to right. be a little bit better in all these different buckets of their life right so we did we did like four calls we did a call every week i mean it, it took a lot of time but when we created the product and sold it we didn't know what we were going to talk about. We didn't even know we were going to do a call a week. We did, We were just like, man, there's a lot of energy here. Let's let's freaking sell this thing and 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 give the people what they want, and we'll create it along the way. We don't need to watch a dang YouTube video because right. this is the way we live our life. The well, see, when you live your life the way that we live our lives, you don't ever have to hold anything back. I don't have to hold any stories back from you guys. I don't. I don't have a story or 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 a piece of wisdom. I never say I. May, I better not put that on Instagram right now because I might need something else to post next week. Right. Because the way we live our lives, the well will never run dry mm. because we stay in the arena. We stay in the arena of life. We're constantly creating more wisdom, learning more lessons, um, building more stories. It's never going to run dry, man. It's easy. I think that's part of being creative. I mean, Trev's been, fuck, you've been out here for what, a year and a half now, right? Yeah, about a year and a half. And you're, I mean, you're constantly bored, right? You do. <laughs> I just stare at walls. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the cool things. Like, like I'll log in, I'll see what Trevor's doing. And I'll be like, oh man, that's fucking cool, Trev. Like, I didn't realize you were doing that. My wife and I were talking about this the other day. She's like, I need to get some upgraded uh, meat skills on the Traeger. And I was like, oh, you need to, you need to call Trev. He knows what, like, what thermometers to get. And he's been spending some time on that. And, but I know he's in the pursuit, right? He's in the pursuit mm. of of getting it done. And I think that's the whole premise of even this podcast is oh, yeah. like when we talked about it early on, 
when we talked about what we wanted out of this podcast, it was, you know, we wanted to inspire people to go out and just fucking live it. I mean, that was the mission statement for getting this started. I love the name, by the way. You guys yeah. crushed it on the name, dude. We didn't do that. That was Andy. <laughs> that was Andy Stump and okay. John Dudley. Thanks, but, John. And Andy. Yeah, thank you, thank you, guys. And uh, you know, we're we were just fortunate enough to know those guys. So they were like, "Here, why don't you guys buy this from us?" So, but I mean, you know, they that. they essentially had that background noise as the mission statement, anyways, right? You know, when it's, they started it, like, I mean, I I was there for when they when they got the whole thing rolling. And yeah. That was how they were living their lives. That's how they wanted to do it anyways. Well, and I think that being an example, right, like, you know, you go out and you do some incredible things on a regular basis. And I think for us, you know, when we look at like John, and that's one of the reasons why we have the arrowhead in the logo was this whole thing that brought us together was mm -hmm. archery. Yep. This whole thing that brought us all together on mm -hmm. this whole thing was archery because you know, I was, re I was shooting a traditional bow back in the day, and then I got turned on to, you know, the compound bow, and then eventually turned on to to, to John, and then we all kind of connected through, you know, as an adult trying to learn a new skill, something that I'd never done before, and we all kind of wanted to do it. I was like, you know, I was archery curious back in the day. You know, I was like talking to. Logan and Matt and all these guys are like, hey, would you guys like to shoot a bow? Or you know, it's not as if I needed a socialization for it. I was just like, man, if we if we do this, like I think we could kind of pull some guys in and really incorporate the skill into what we do. And like I think it's a fascinating way to to one spend time and develop a skill. I fucking yeah. love it. We talk about archery all the fucking time on this show, which people are probably sick of it, but <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> oh, well. Did, are you shooting a bow too? Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the interesting things about archery that I haven't heard discussed much is archery has underwent a huge evolution compared to what it was when I first started. Right. And I'm actually kind of pissed that all you cool guys got into it because <laughs> now it costs me a freaking 1200 1500 bucks to go buy a dang bow. Sorry. When I first started shooting, dude, you could buy like, like when I first started shooting compound, like I remember when the first like parallel Lambo came out, I was, I started shooting the old Matthews SQ2s oh, yeah. and the Q2s and like you could buy the top bow for that year. For like five hundred bucks, a sight was like eighty bucks. A right. dozen arrows was like sixty bucks. Like it, it has underwent a huge evolution. I started shooting bows literally when I was probably eight years old. I never wow. forget my first bow. Uh, about the third arrow I shot, I sailed it across the yard and hit the side of our minivan. My dad took my bow from me and <laughs> broke it over his knee. Um, and once he cooled off, <laughs> he bought me another bow, and he bought my brother a bow, too. And so... Uh, Aimed you away from the minivan. Yeah, got us away from the <laughs> minivan. I remember uh, my, uh, my brother and I had these brand new bows, and um, my brother was three years younger than me, and I had backed his limb bolts off so much so he could pull his yeah. bow back. He goes back to take his first shot, and the freaking top limb comes unscrewed out of the riser and pops back and freaking puts a massive gash in his forehead. So, my, like, I have so many stories around archery because I've done it for so long. And um, the evolution has been crazy. I'm, I'm joking that, you know, I'm pissed off that you guys got into it. I think it's awesome that you guys got into it because it is an amazing discipline. Um, for me, though, it's just, it's been a part of my life right. yeah. for so long. Like, there's not a picture out there of me shooting my bow. Right. Um, uh, it's just like part of me. Yeah. It's part of who I am. It's an amazing discipline. Um, and I am a bow hunter. Now, back when I first started bow hunting, it was frowned upon oh, yeah. to bow hunt, okay? Yeah. There were, there were a lot of farms that would not let you hunt. If you were bow hunting, yep. because they thought you're just gonna you're gonna lose this animal, and you know, and it was frowned upon. People thought you were freaking idiots to do to yep. be bow hunting. 
Um, but that's that's all really I've ever done. Guns are to kill people. Right. Uh, bows are to hunt with, and and that's the that's kind of the way I view um, the the hunting aspect of my life. And I got a lot of layers, man. I'm pretty multi-dimensional. I don't tell my hunting stories a whole lot. That was one of the cool things about coming here with you guys. You guys are all bow hunters, and you know. Well, that's one of the things that. You know, even I remember growing up, my cousin was way into archery, way into archery. And I was always like, what the fuck? I mean, I was like, I, I had that question in my mind forever. I remember even a few years ago when guys would show up and they're, and they'd be like, well, I'm, I'm shooting my bow. Well, Baker, Baker was shooting his bow back in the day. I'm like, he's like, you got to get one of these. I'm like, no, I don't. I got a rifle, man. Like I'm going to, if yeah. I want to headshot a deer at fucking 200 from the standing, I'll yeah. be fine, right? I can do that. That's like, but I didn't get it. I, I didn't get it. But then once I started shooting the bow, then it was like totally different ha. story. Then, yeah, it's like, okay. It's a lifestyle, man. It is. And then once you, once you shoot an animal with the bow, then it's nope. like game over. Like it's, it's unbelievable. Game over. It's game over. I remember the first, I mean, I will never, I, I've forgotten a lot of things because my brain's been rattled quite right. a few times, but I'll never forget the first, you know, animal that I took with a bow and just, you know, jawing back, you know, I was young, man. I was, you know, maybe 12 years old hunting by myself in a climbing stand. Right. And here comes this buck, man. And I just will never forget drawing back on him and just, just the sound it makes, the sound it makes. And then you... Time slows down, right? Yeah. You see the side of that animal go crimson, yeah. crimson red. And it's just like, holy crap, dude. Like, then the work begins, but it's unbelievable, man. Yeah, we're we're getting deeper into it still with the traditional shooting. And I'm kind of riding trevor's uh wake on this stuff and we're like texting like hey when are we shooting tomorrow like when, when are we <laughs> carving out an hour to get out there and shoot our, our trad bows and for me it's so different that i've become obsessed with it because with our backgrounds we're so used to front sight rear sight and even with a compound compound bow and then you pick up the stick yeah there's no sights yep. and it's so completely different and anything you're like I have to use my eyes to aim. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's such a different animal, but it's so much fun to yep. suck. Like I suck at it right now. Like I'm not happy with my performance whatsoever. But like you go through this process of like getting your groups a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter, a little bit tighter. And then like in the back of your mind, there's like what I will need to do in order to hunt an animal with this thing, the, the space that I'm going to need to to close in order to have this thing happen. Like it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. And like, I can't wait to get to that point where I have that confidence in that discipline to be able to go and do that thing. Well, it's so weird and it's a different turn of psychology too. And your bomb and arrow is like a total archery challenge. We're at like you know, 111. <laughs> yeah. That's Whee! awesome. Man. We're like bombing arrows at a hundred or like a ball size target. Yeah. It, it, and I remember when we were out there, we, we hit a target at like 90 or whatever yeah. it was. Right. Cause we were shooting out to 90 and I was like, man, this, this compound is like, it, it's kind of, it's not, it's not as difficult as the trad because the trad means you got to get real fucking close. Oh yeah. You got to get, you know, like Aaron was talking about, like taking his shoes off mm -hmm. and, you know, t he took his shoes off like five times or some shit when he was stalking that one mule deer that he was telling that yep. story about. And, you know, so then I'm thinking about what is it going to take to evolve? Because right now I can say that I, I shoot my bow relatively well, right? Yeah. And now I have to actually evolve into a hunter because yeah. it's different. I'm a shooter that can kill things, but I'm not a competent hunter. I would no, never class. I would never classify myself. I, we've all had kind of the shortcut, and Dudley's yeah. mentioned that. He's like, yeah, you know, it's kind of fun to watch watch guys with you know a decade plus and in, in a shooting background come into shooting a compound because it's like turnkey. Like once I give them the yeah. tools, 
in a week, it's like, where the fuck did you come from? <laughs> right? <laughs> this is not fair. When you make that transition to traditional, that's when you really make that transition to, you, you have the realization that now this becomes a lifestyle because it is something that you, ha you have to do it every single day. Right. You have to be sharper. Uh, the biggest buck I've ever killed was with a traditional bow, wow. a Black Widow recurve bow. Yeah. Um, you you want to talk about, you know, Trev, you talked about building arrows. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's a whole nother ball game. Um, you know, so when you make that transition, it's a game changer. And you're going to, dude, it, you, as you guys come up in traditional archery, you're going to have so many animals that you're going to kick yourself in the butt for having that freaking stick in your hand. Because <laughs> you're like, man, I could smoke this joker mm -hmm. right now with my compound. <laughs> and it's frustrating, dude. But, man, when you connect, when you connect with that recurve, especially on a big trophy animal, right? Um, it is, I can see it in my mind right now as clear as day in my tree stand. First time I had ever taken my recurve bow hunting in the woods. I had been shooting for about a year, right? Took it to the woods, get up in my stand. I've been up there 10 minutes. This massive chocolate rack, 10 point white tail buck, probably 140 inch buck. That's a big buck for me. Yeah. Comes at 10 yards. I draw back, shoot him. He drops right there in front of me. He's not dead, but he's on the ground. Right. And it's just like, I cannot freaking believe that just happened. It's, it, it is next level. It really is, man. Not that not that compound hunting is fun too, but the traditional stuff, that's where my passion really is. You know, you're having to calculate kinetic energy right. in your arrows. You know, I build my arrows out. I use the Eastern Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. I'll put a three grain per inch weight tube, full length of the shaft, uh, 125 grain broadhead. So I'm building these arrows literally from the inside out. Wow. Feathers, you got to treat the feathers because you got to worry about the rain. Um, the broadheads are different. It's just, it's very, very complex to us. Yeah. It's been going on for thousands of years, yeah, but. but it, yeah, it's super complex. I mean, you're getting ready for <clears throat> elk hunt in Montana. Month and a half. Yeah, a month and a half with your trad bow. Yep. And Good I for mean, you, brother. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> 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 you know, I've got a brown bear hunt that I'm, psychologically committing to shoot with my bow this year and not a trad bow. I've got to fucking commit to the compound first. It's baby steps for me on this one because I had to just get over the rifle first. I'd be like, yeah. Cause I'm comfortable in that pocket, right? Yeah. Like, psychologically, I'm comfortable with that. I'm like, ah, whatever, man, I'll fucking I build exactly what you're talking about. Like when we couldn't get that moose to come in in Canada and uh, the guy that actually hands me his rifle, he's like, they'll kill you if you don't kill this thing. Cause we just couldn't get him across the, a lake. I was so com I'm so comfortable with the rifle that he handed it to me. And I'm like, "What's it zeroed at?" And he tells me, "I'm like, all right, we're fine. Yeah, we're good." I'm like, bro, this is why I didn't. This is why I don't want a rifle hunt because you handed yeah. me this thing and my heart rate went down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like yeah, I'm not yeah. supposed to be more comfortable now. <laughs> it's, it's like putting on an, a comfy old jacket. You're like, got okay, it. got it. You know, and I think having that feeling of uncertainty. Because the feeling of certainty in a hunt with makes, a rifle makes you less present. It really does. Like, and I'm not mud sucking guys that like to hunt with their rifles at all. I think that because I hunt with a rifle, I hunt with a bow, I'll yeah. hunt with whatever. Right? I I hunt and I don't care about trophy size. Like, I'm I'm just trying to share meat with my with my family and my my friends and my company. Yeah, I'll kill if it's in season. I got a tag, man. Like, it's <clears> going <throat> it's going down and. You know, I just know that with rifle, for me, I don't get that same feeling. I don't get connected to a hunt. I don't, I'm not as careful with my footing. I'm not looking mm -hmm. at my gear. I'm not looking at myself as much. I've got to go really inward with archery. And I think traditional forces you to go further because now you've got to get really intimate with the yeah. environment and you got to get really yeah. intimate with your gear yeah i mean uh jeff told me and i'm going up next month to go help scout for the herd that we're going to be looking at right he's like yeah bring everything you're going to hunt in um 
he's been doing it for decades and he's like, bring everything you're going to hunt in. Cause I'm going to put it behind the house and let it out, let it sit out in the rain and then lay it across some, uh, some pine boughs and just leave it out until we go hunt. Right. Yeah. Like yep. that's how far down the rabbit hole you have to get yep. to get to the point where yep. he hunts with a longbow. Like, and especially when you start talking about animals like bear, I mean, yeah. I've taken two bear with archery equipment, over, both of them over 500 pounds. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you talk about, I, I can distinctly remember the last bear I took, um, shot him, knocked him down. I like to spine shoot stuff. I'm a real big, I, I'm right or wrong. That's the way I like to right. shoot my animals. Um, I got a knife. I can, you know, take care of them at the end, but right. I like to spine shoot them, get them down. So I did that on that bear and, uh, knocked him down. And you want to talk about a tough animal. Those animals are unbelievably tough. He drags himself into these weeds that are about six foot, seven foot tall, like grass weeds, like I couldn't see anything. And I'm parting the weeds just to see the next like spot of blood, right? right? Right there in front of me. And finally, I part the weeds and there that joker lays, <laughs> and he's looking at me, like fully alive. And like he gets up and comes after me. <laughs> and and luckily I lost him in those right. weeds. But so I give him another, you know, I give him another hour or so. I thought he was, I thought he had expired the first time because a bear, a lot of times when you shoot them, yep. they'll make a lot of noise and they call it like the death moan. Mm-hmm. You'll hear them when they're dying. Now you guys have bear hunted, y'all know mm-hmm. that. So he he did that, but he didn't, he did not die. He's and tricking you. Yep. So I come back out and then I'm like, uh, now I got to go back in on him a second time. You know, and it's it's intense, brother. It really is. And luckily, he was he was expired the second time I went in on him. But I can't wait to see how your brown bear hunt goes, man. Me too. I can't wait. Well, I think you'll probably be there. I'm not yeah, sure. I'll be helping guiding. Yeah. So we've got a good friend of ours, Cole, that's been on the show before. We've got a couple guys going up. I mean, we're going to do that. I think we're going to do that blacktail hunt too. Mm-hmm. And so that's like December. But yeah. We're full on now, right? So all of us, you know, we got, I got 15 bows for guys in the company, people in the company. We got an archery range out back. We've got a 3D target range down in Texas that we're opening up to the company and to adaptive athletes. So we're, we're, we're like fully chips in fucking archery. Dud was making a a joke about it where he's like, I'm going to start calling this black Black Archery Coffee Company pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. That's yeah, like awesome, Black dude. Bow Coffee Company. Yeah, that. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I'm not quite committed to that yet. I mean, of course, Logan and I have two Seekin 6.5s that we've got to like <laughs> get <laughs> fucking with. get race ready here pretty soon because <laughs> we, we, I grew up in Lewiston, Idaho and Glenn Seekins is at, he, he's an Idahoan, Lewiston guy, Seekins Precision is up there and, and, uh, I've, I've been trying to figure out a way to get a Seekins for the last couple of years and not free, right? So it was like, actually get it like done. actually buy it you know i'm not one of those guys i don't fucking go with my hand out to companies asking them for free shit like that's not the way we work yeah. so we finally had something to celebrate for and i fucking except oh. yeti yeah except for yeti <laughs> they can give us all the free stuff thanks <laughs> yeti. you know thanks, but, guys. those seekins rifles for for prs well that, that was a whole other thing we went up to that precision rifle shoot where it's all you know six five dasher and all these fucking crazy rounds and I, I think it's just more appropriate for me to classify myself as a projectile enthusiast. Like the more I attach myself to that statement, I'm like, man, I don't give a fuck. Like, I don't care if it comes out of a rifle. I don't care if it comes off a string. I don't care if it comes off an, like an addle or a fucking yeah. skee ball Slingshot. table. I don't give a fuck. It's like, I am addicted to trying to hit targets. Yep. And if I can hit them and eat them even fucking better, man, we could get to that point where wh- what are those, uh, those sticks, I forget what the Native like Americans the used to. Sticks? Yeah, the rabbit sticks, but they had a Native American where you're like throwing that weighted yeah, club at yeah. rabbits. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, that shit looks fun. <laughs> I love to kill a rabbit with one of those. That's really smart, though, Evan. I mean, to to 
keep to keep that viewpoint right because in a lot of places in the u.s now the the bow hunters and the gun hunters are pitted against each other and that doesn't solve anything right like our hunting privileges um rights i don't even want to call it a privilege it's our freaking right to hunt right um they are they are and have been eroded and uh thankfully you're we're seeing a big rebound now Mm -hmm. just here recently but um for us to be pitted against each other as hunters is a, is a very poor choice uh, in order to preserve the things that we love to do. So I love your outlook on that, man. I mean, that's solid. Well, and you're you're much similar, right? I mean, I see. Oh yeah, I man. see a lot of your posts, like you know what's happening in the United States. You know where you live, where you live, and I see it. You know, across the United States with the, the anti pro two A people, and it's like. I'm I'm pro individual liberty, right? Yes. So like I I'm just pro man, get it done, be an adult, you know, be conscious of others around you. If it doesn't fuck with anybody else, like just be and let be, man. You do you and leave you me do alone. you. But it's our right. Right. So yeah. for me, I'm a I, I believe in it. I, I think you're much similar. You know, I don't know if you have a different take on it. I mean, where you where you're at in Georgia, it doesn't seem like people are anti gun unless you get probably into southern Georgia, I would imagine. Maybe like Atlanta, some places around there. Yeah, but. maybe around Atlanta, but I mean the culture that we have in the southeast is uh in my opinion, it's the best culture on earth. Yeah. Uh, we love freedom. Like this like we're wide open in the south. Yeah. Like there's no mask mandate. Like Right. There's a, like restaurants are open, like like we're living life, we're, man. Because you're living life. We love, and, and I I don't want to I don't want to pit I don't want to put down anybody else living anywhere else in the U.S. But there's a reason that I live where I live. Right. It's because I love that culture. We love our freedom, buddy. We could muster, we could muster a force <laughs> in the South <laughs> in the matter of a week that could crush. Anything, anybody that wanted to invade our country, like right. we've got comms, yeah. we've got gun, <laughs> we've got everything, yeah. Like, and and we we take that stuff very seriously, man. And and we don't. A, a lot a lot of people actually put me down, man, for owning guns and like ammunition. It's like I get a lot of I get do get a lot of flack for that on social media and Seriously? stuff. And Oh, yeah, man, because my audience is different than your audience, Evan. Like, yeah. So one thing about my brand is, like, I don't talk a lot about the current issues. Like, that's just not part of my brand. Like, yeah, this, is, this conversation for me here is because I know your audience is receptive to yeah. it. So I do, man. My audience is different. I get a lot of pushback. And I want people to understand, I don't own an armory of weapons because I'm afraid of anything. It, that's not out of fear. I'm not stockpiling ammunition because I'm afraid. I'm actually, I actually prepare myself. I'm, I'm being prepared right. in order to eliminate fear from my life. Right. Because I have the training, I have the resources, and I have the tools to take care of any situation that I'm faced with in life. And I also have the people. I'm yeah. surrounded with the people that sure. can help me in that mission. Um, so it's not out of fear. It's actually in order to defeat fear and defend freedom. All right? So let's make that clear real quick. I think I think there's a lot of people that are shifting. We've talked about it a few times. I think there are a lot of people that are shifting their mentality and they're realizing that this way of life that we're talking about having, you know, independence, Mm -hmm. having our individual freedoms, taking responsibility, right. Especially with like the defund the police conversations or, you know, mask mandates in cities and all these fucking crazy regulations that are, that are coming down from, you know, mayors and governors that a lot of people are embracing. Hey, I got to go be able to take care of myself. Mm. I yeah. got to go and take care of myself. And it's always like, welcome to the fucking party, man. Like, you know, it's pretty cool over here when you guys decide to like, you know, 
get out of your own fucking prison and like break yourself out mm-hmm. and decide that you're going to take some ownership in your own life. Maybe hunt for your food. Maybe you have a garden in your backyard. Maybe not not worry about whether or not the cops are 20 minutes away. I'll tell you what, when I close my fucking doors at night and turn off the lights, I'm not thinking, I hope the cops can come in time. I'm thinking, man, that sorry sack of shit that ever decides to fucking hit that door. Wow. Better hope I don't wake up, man. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like, I, and, you know, you it's like a joke. that tomahawk out. Right. It's a joke. It's like, man, I got my pro timer and my 43 sitting next to my fucking... <laughs> Yeah, nice, man. Dan. I want to yeah. check my split times on this shit working in. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of people. <laughs> You're right, Evan. You're so right, man. And I'm seeing a lot of people that are in my audience that would have never been receptive right. to those type of TTPs yeah. that now are all of a sudden coming to me like, hey, man. Can can we talk about this? I built so I built a range. Yeah. And I opened another company. Yeah. And we train. Um That's but funny. but like like I, I took I don't have a lot of money, but I took what money I had and I built a freaking range, yeah. man. And I bought two thousand dollars worth of steel. And the people that that I think should know these type of TTPs, I'm very selective about who I train, but right. we come out and we freaking train and we have real talk. But these are people that six months ago would not have been receptive to this type of conversation at all. They would have actually thought that yeah. we were fools. Yeah. Like a bunch of fucking redneck fools, right? Like, I don't know how many people have classified that as, it's like, you really? You hillbillies. Yeah, you hillbillies are, it's like, really? Because when this whole thing hit and we were talking about it, it's like, man, I got fucking a thousand pounds of wild meat and freezers right it's, yeah it, like i have you know we built a compound out here that can turn into a a, a fire base at any point in time yep. like, who's the fool right yep. it's like okay Still man go to the fob you know yep. you, you're you got a you got a front wheel drive camry and a set of golf clubs in your house <laughs> yeah you need to fucking check yourself man like i don't know what the fuck you're thinking <laughs> well, well dude, dude it's you know, you talk about fear, man. We've talked a lot about fear in this conversation. Yeah. Fear has, but fear is becoming a virtue. Yeah. That's a really weird thing that's happening right now to where the people that are afraid think that they're better than you because they're afraid. That's interesting. They really yeah. do. That that's this whole this whole mask thing. Look, people people will if you make a post on Instagram about not wearing a mask, you will get torn apart. Like you will get torn because people legitimately think because they are afraid and and they do this whole freaking bull crap that they're better than you. Mm-hmm. It, that fear is not a virtue. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. You think about we're doing things right now. Think about what are the social and psychological effects going to be of this whole freaking mask thing? And and when is it going to end? Like, what, what's the point? You start giving up these freedoms, right. you don't get it back, brother. No. It's, it's, like, it's like my buddy told me uh, earlier today, he's like, it's trying to put toothpaste back into the, the toothpaste <laughs> tube. Yeah. You, you don't get it freaking back. So what's the point that it's like, all right, we don't have to be afraid anymore. So we can actually now have conversation with each other. We can see each other smile. We can act like human beings again. What what is that point when there's no virus? No, that's never going to happen. So we've given this freedom away. We've we've accepted this all of this stuff, and it's freaking crazy, man. Well, that's interesting because I've never thought about it like that, but I've similar where you know fear used to be looked down on yep. right so as we look at this national conversation we look at you know who and how we shape our society and if we continue to kind of placate to people that are making fear based decisions mm. all the time that's a fucking scary scary world it's not a world i want to live Amen, in man brother like that's that's some 1984 Orwellian shit right there. That's like, that's crazy. What are you talking about? We saw it. 
1981, Communist Russia. Yeah, we did. That place fucking exists. That place exists. <laughs> you have... I, you you want to have fish only on Thursdays? <laughs> Stand in line. No like, running water? Does, like, that, does this sound familiar? <laughs> Standing in line for food? Yeah. Mm. You know, the government will take care of you. <laughs> this entire information operation about how the government is going to take care of you. The government's responsibility is to take care of you, to get used to this government handout. You know, here, take government money, listen to the government for your health advice, listen to the government because they're going to tell you what's best. And it's like, have we not been paying attention for the last couple hundred years that the people that run our fucking cities, states, our federal government, they, they don't typically have our best intentions and in, 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 that's not them. Like, and the more we forfeit our freedoms, the more we forfeit our liberty, the more we listen to these fucking idiots. Like, it, and they're idiots, by the way. Nobody's having a national conversation about health. Like, we, we brought it up. Nobody's oh. having a national conversation about, hey, this is the time to get fit. This is the time to be yeah. outside. Yeah. This is the time to... Throw away all your diet. vegetable oil. Throw away your fucking, yeah, throw away your sugar. Throw away your fucking vegetable oil. Throw away your shit. Like, stop smoking. Stop being an idiot. I just want to hear one conversation about, from, from a national perspective of someone in a leadership position, it's like, here's how to maintain a healthy immune system. Well, you just you stand up all the congressmen and senators and you look at them and what? There's probably a couple that are maybe a little healthy. Oh yeah, man. A lot of those people look like the fat asses that you're going. What have you been eating for the last thirty years? Nadler, that that guy looks like a a, a Batman <laughs> villain, man. He looks like the Penguin or something. Like he walks like. Don't it. listen to that guy about health. Ever? Like, are you fucking crazy, like, <laughs> man? Trump eats like fast food every day, man. Like he don't. You don't want to listen to that guy about your health either, dude. Like no. don't listen to these people. He makes Instagram Close posts about like McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, like come on, man. Like these guys are all yeah, insulin man. resistant because of their lifestyle. They are <laughs> fucked up. Like stop listening to those guys. Like you'll get more information from listening to a bunch of fucking knuckle draggers on a stupid podcast, whether it's ours or somebody else's, <laughs> yeah. than like what yeah. Nadler has to say or Fakashi or whatever the fucking CDC guy's name is. Like <laughs> that that dude these guys don't have our best intentions and they don't have I truly what what I truly believe this to my fucking heart of hearts is like what makes America great is their ability to to forge independence, right? We're mm -hmm. independence, like self-reliance, like what what the whole Western expansion, the the what's woven into American DNA is basically saying, fuck off, we're gonna do it our way. Optimism. And to promote the people that are so fear driven that they can't come out and take part in life. Why the fuck would we ever listen to them is mind boggling to me. It is. It is. You, and you can't make sense of something that is illogical. No. Um, here's something I've been struggling with, guys. And, and you, you've been in this business a lot. You, you've been in this place, this space, I guess, a lot longer than I have. I've only been out for a year. You know, life is new to me. This life is new to me. It's like, so how, but how do you handle it? Like, we're having this conversation on a, on a public platform that's going to reach, you know, thousands of people. It makes us feel good to say these things. So we're going down the rabbit hole right sure. now yeah. because mm -hmm. it's it satisfies us. Um, it, it's truth. It is truth, and it needs truth needs to be heard. We're speaking truth. It's making us feel good at the same time. But like, as an as an influencer, as a brand, like what's what's the line? Because I see a lot of guys now, especially former military guys, that are freaking blowing their load on social media about these all these topics. They're just blowing their freaking load, man. And they're doing it because it satisfies them. It's actually a lack of discipline. Mm -hmm. They're going on social media and just blowing their freaking top about all this stuff and just going deep down the rabbit hole. And it's like, what are you accomplishing, man? 
Like you're just trying, you're just making yourself feel better. Really, it's a lack of discipline. So like, what's the line for you between like, like that's something I've been struggling with. Like how much do I utilize my platform in order to promote truth, but promote truth in a way that's not also stirring up strife? Because there's a lot of things about our conversation right here that will stir up strife for a lot of people. So that balance, I've I've really been struggling with that, man. You know, that's a, <laughs> that's a complex question. Yeah, it's, but. it's a complex question. I think for us, you know, we try to use we we have three pieces of of types of content that we really try to stick to: information, entertainment, and and, and information, inspiration, and entertainment. Awesome, and. The podcast, I think, is a different form of 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 media where you you want to listen to a conversation. I don't think that Twitter is a place where you can have a complex conversation. That's a fucking that's a burning trash heap of shit, right? It's yeah. you can't have a fucking complex yeah. conversation with a real human in two hundred and forty characters or less. Like it's been proven that texting is the worst form of fucking communication we can actually have. Mm-hmm. It is proven. And now you're limiting the characters that you can put <laughs> on a text message and people are fucking so angry. Well, do you wonder why? Because it's the worst form of communication there is. You're, yeah. you're limiting a fucking text message to 240 characters and maybe an emoji or two. It's the dumbest <laughs> hey, form included. of communication there is. Mm-hmm. So for social media, if you... St- for us, it's like stick to those three things. If people want to hear my stupid ass talk, it it's super easy. You can tune into this and you can listen to my fucking diatribes on like don't forfeit your freedom, take self-responsibility, take your own initiative, fix your problems, stop fucking eating garbage, kill your own food, you know, go out and fucking live life. Like, hey, that's this, that's the whole premise of it, right? It's 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 really not that complex. But this is the forum for, you know, more complex conversation because you can do it. It's people can watch the video or they can listen to it. They can hear the dumb shit that bangs around in our heads. And, but we come and I'm discrediting it to a different, a different perspective, but you know, you have 11 years in the Navy, Trev, you got how many, eight, nine, nine? you know, how many years in Marine Corps? Six, four, four, four years in Marine Corps. You know, I've got fucking 20 years of government service between, yeah. you know, agency and all this shit that I've put together. Like, I've lived in fucking Iraq and Afghanistan and in, in lived in these countries. I've served under the government. So have you guys. So not to discredit our intelligence or anything, but we do offer a lot, I think. We do offer a, a very f- interesting perspective that is founded in experience. We have a lot of experience with the government just in general. Yeah. A lot of people don't even have a lot of experience with the government. I'm here to tell you. It's one of my favorite things to say when people are spouting off conspiracy theories and like, ah, you know, they're keeping secrets. I'm like, man, if you work for the government, <laughs> you would know full well they can't keep any fucking secrets. Amen to that, brother. That's, that's yeah. it. That's an old wooden boat full of fucking holes. You know that shit, yeah. right? Yeah. That's just leaky float. as hell. Yeah. And they're and they're fucking dumb. Like, and when I say that, it's everybody in every facet of life. You get people that are just fucking dumb, right? You know, I remember very, very distinctively the times in which I made sure that I I remember this, right? When I was on the I was on a polygraph for fucking three days, and the dude was burning me down over letting the guides and my river guiding company smoke marijuana, and I'm like. Holy fuck. <laughs> wow, man. Like this guy, you know, 20 some years old, the poly- polygrapher, you know, he, there, it, it's not as if everybody is like this. There's a ton of patriots that serve in the United States government, but it's like, there are a lot of people in the government that are very me oriented. Me, me, me. They're not mission oriented, they're me oriented. And the less freedom, the less, you know, the, the, the less that we can capitulate over and give yep. to others, the more we can bring on board and assume responsibility for. 
I just want, that's what I want. That's what I'm so hungry for. If I can just get people to assume more responsibility for their own lives, their own destiny, and become less like the government will take care of me, man, I, I think that's mission accomplished, yeah. right? It's fucking mission accomplished. So bring guys like you on going, dude, you're running 100 fucking mile races. You, you had fucking heart surgery to go join the, to join the Navy and become a SEAL. Like, fuck, talk about putting your destiny in your own hands. Like, that shit is awe-inspiring in the sense of, like, this is the shit that people need to be listening to from my perspective. If I, yep. if I could download this episode without me on it, I'd be like, this is fucking rad. You guys are rad. <laughs> we can make that happen. Yeah, I'll just edit me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I love your answer, though, Evan. I, I think for me, you know, I'm struggling with that internally because, like I say, I, ha- I feel like I have a responsibility um, to, to talk about freedom and to talk about you know, put that stuff out there. But I think it is important to be cognizant of what platform you use to have that conversation. And essentially, that's what I, the main point I got out of your message. And, you know, I see it, I I don't do Twitter, but on Instagram, I see guys I served with, like I say, man, they're just losing it on there, dude. And I'm like, man, what are you, what are you trying, you're not accomplishing anything. You've got a bunch of people that follow you and they're all agreeing with you and that's it right you're you're what are you trying to convince the people that already believe the way that you believe that like that's not even a freaking thing man so that's the beautiful thing about the podcast i think is this is a great place to have those conversations you know that's a great answer man i love it well, I think there are a bunch of people out there that they need the talking points to, they do, they need the talking points to go out and tell their friends, go out and talk about these things where it doesn't make sense to me. When I say this, like these things don't make sense to me. Like I was in Iraq for I don't know how many years and I'll tell you right now that the place was a fucking dumpster fire. I'm not a pro-Iraq war vet, right? I'm not saying we did the right thing. I'm saying no. You know, I, if you were to ask me my political opinions on a bunch of different things, I'm like, you know, pro pot, pro guns, you know, pro choice, pro, like I'm all over the fucking map. Mm -hmm. Like I'm all over the fucking map because it's about assuming individual responsibility for your own life, your own destiny. Mm -hmm. Stop blaming your fucking problems on everybody else around you. Stop burning people down that are like, well, it's their fault. Or, you know, like our going back to our previous conversation, it's like, well, that guy was on my, you know, that guy was in a fucking real seal. He was in the Navy and he just talked about being in the Navy and gave people the fucking ideas. Like, it's like, man, you guys are a bunch of negative pricks. They need to, they need to wake up and maybe start like a tomato plant in their fucking backyard or something. I don't know. Go love something. Yeah. Go, go like, <laughs> go plant a fucking tree. I, I don't know what they need to do, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, yeah. I don't know. You reassess your <laughs> freaking boundaries. Yeah. But you say, and you say that word, Trev, that word love, man. And you know, one, one place I think you and I kind of differ Evan, and you know, is is the fact that you are extremely on that libertarian side. Like you said, it's like you do what you want to do, as long as it's not coming down my driveway and affecting me. I'm freaking cool with that, man. I think one place where you and I would differ is I, I'm a Christian, mm-hmm. so there are there are certain things that I can't. I can't necessarily be on that that level of libertarian that you are. So, so I guess my moral principles, what I would view as what is truth and what is right, mm-hmm. it right. comes from outside of me. Right. All right. So if somebody asks me, am I pro-choice? Mm-hmm. Like, is it affecting me that, you know, we are literally murdering hundreds of thousands of children Every year, is that affecting me in my driveway? No, it's not. So why should I care? But I do care. Because there are things that are right, and there are things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. There is good in the world, and there is evil in the world. It's a fine, that's a, and I, I, the faith, my faith is probably most my, my most valuable possession that I have in my life. 
What's so valuable about it is it gives me a standard of truth that is outside of myself. So I have something outside of myself that I can go and consult. Mm-hmm. And, de- and that determines my viewpoint on that subject. Um, so that's just, a, a, I think, a difference between our beliefs. And it's a cool conversation. I've mm-hmm. never had, I've never put it out there like that. You know what I mean? But- so you, as a libertarian, on that level, you still have to have values and morals and things that you stand upon. Oh, yeah. So how does that work for you, man? Well, I mean— so I would say that, you know, I am, I am ethically opposed to abortion, like just straight up. I'm ethically opposed to it. I don't think our tax dollars should be going to subsidize abortion in any way, shape or form. The government should not take my tax dollars out of my pocket or your pocket or everybody else's pocket and forcefully take my money and go out and perform abortions with it. That's, that's, that's a fucking deal that I didn't make. Yeah. Right. I don't agree with it, and uh, but I am a firm believer, and this is where it is a debate within even myself, because if I'm ethically opposed to it, and I don't want my tax dollars going to it, but I also have to believe that people are entitled to freedom, and there are times in a person's life where I don't control them, and I don't want the government to control people, so I have to sacrifice my one side where I'm ethically opposed for the other side, which is I want individual freedom and I do not want the fucking government in my life. Like I, I don't want that. it. So when I say that, I'm also pro public lands where I think lands have to be protected. I think mm-hmm. there are people that are pure profiteers that would exploit and ultimately exploit and fucking sacrifice our lands that we use to harvest fucking deer and elk and turkey and everything else for profit. There are a lot of people out there that would do that. The majority. Fuck yeah, yeah, man. So that's where, you know, it's a little bit more of a a liberal perspective to think that we need a very robust public lands policy with people that absolutely protect the environment from corporate profiteers because they would fucking do it. So, but that's, government <laughs> that's that's actually government control but i'm like man i don't know how else to solve that problem to be honest with you i know right? yeah, that's tough brother it's a tough one yes it really is and i i've had that debate with guys where where does it end right if if from a religious perspective where people need to have the their freedom of religion they need to have it that, that is a fucking right of the United States. That's what differentiates us. I think Christians are persecuted in the United States by the far left. That's fucking proven. But I also think that there are a lot of other religions that are just fucking blatantly persecuted for no fucking reason mm-hmm. because atheists have the, the educational high ground, right? They control the university, universities. So yeah. if you believe in God, you're automatically put into a bucket where it's completely, uh, I think it's unjustified in that sense because there's nobody on the planet that can tell us what is accurate or true when it comes to how the fuck we got here and where we're going next. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's nobody. And when I say that, I'm not saying that Christians, they have, there is absolutely not a priest or a person on the planet that can tell me exactly what happens when the lights go out. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. You might have your interpretation. You might believe that this is what's going to happen, but it's not as if we can say, "I don't have either either of those." Right? I have my own experiences. Your experience. I have. I have experiences. I believe the way I believe because of that. It's not to do. I'm fallible. Right. I'm foul. I'm in in all aspects of my life. I'm fallible. I don't value my interpretation or my opinions at all <laughs> because they change. Right. They've changed throughout my life. But when you have experiences that lead you to a relationship with a creator, experiences, that's when it becomes real. For me, that's when it became real. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think, I think being a Christian will eventually and is well on its way to people looking at you and thinking you're mentally unstable mm-hmm. because you believe in a God. 
because of experiences that have led you to that point. It's a dangerous place, man. It's a super dangerous place. I think about it, you know, even internationally, when we look at the different types of religions and anyway, you know, it, when in America, it seems like people are more conditioned to say that we should treat other religions with respect than Christianity. And I'm saying, no, man, this is freedom of religion, right? It is yeah. what it is. And, you know, we've worked with Muslims, we've worked with Jews, we've worked with Christians, we've worked all around the world in a multiple different wide variety of things. And who am I to tell, you know, a, you know, a guy that lives in the, you know, the Sioux Indian reservation is still practicing his Native American beliefs that he's wrong. I'm fucking nobody, right? I got, I, exactly. I'm nobody, right? I can't condemn that person. I can't condemn anybody that has a true belief in what they're doing. Now, there are times when you're like, you look at something and you're like, bro, I don't, I, you know, I can't, I can't get behind, I can't get behind so. the whole, like, because it's hypoc- There's a lot of hypocritical shit that happens in oh, religion too, brother. In Christianity, uh, oh my gosh, they're at the top of the list, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll be, I'm right there with you <laughs> on like, that, man. Um, like, yeah. Like, the world I want to live in ultimately is one where individuals are judged by their character, right? And it, it seems like in the past, a lot of religions have judge people to where if if you don't believe this set of beliefs that that you're wrong and that seems kind of fundamentally wrong to me yeah that people would would judge you based off of your attachment to that thing as opposed to judging you as an individual well and it's 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 because if you're not attached and you're not in agreement then you're not part of the system. Right. If you're not part of the system, you're not paying into the system. And if you're not paying into the system, then you're not contributing to that person retaining that's, retaining their power. That's all. That's it. totally right. wrong, though. There is no system. Yeah. Like the Bible actually tells me not to judge. <clears throat> like we have screwed it up. Did, look, if there is a God, he is so much bigger and more magnificent and complex than we are. And as soon as we try to formulate what we call religion and put the club together go sideways we will yep. screw it up so freaking bad yeah. that it's 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 not even it's not even identifiable no you know what i mean well you just the fact like i i forget where i was hearing this just the fact where where, where people can believe in a, a big bang circumstance where you know the entire universe came out of like the the the, the something the equivalent of a golf ball, you can believe in that. You can wrap your head around this, and it's like we can't comprehend the universe. There's not a scientist, an astrophysicist, a theoretical physicist that can accurately comprehend what the fucking universe is. I think we have truly not even scratched the surface of what the fuck is going on. <laughs> You're exactly no, right. Not, we're not even close, man. For people to fucking sit and tell other people what's going on. I mean, what was it? Uh, Galileo or, or uh, um, Da Vinci. There's a, a, a series of these guys that were inventors and they were, they were looking at the stars. They were talking about how, we think the world might be round at one point in the church. Had Galileo, to exactly. Mentally. He had to, he had to say, like, "Yeah, no, you're right. Like we're we're not. We are at the center. We, of the yeah, universe. we're flat. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Like that wasn't that long that ago. That wasn't that no, long ago. When people were all. gonna die if you were like, "Hey, man, I think the world might be round." And then it was like, "Dog, I'm gonna kill you. Yeah, I'm gonna murder you. I'm gonna murder <laughs> your <laughs> belief. Because <laughs> shit <laughs> flat. I can this see shit it. is flat. You're gonna die, son. Yeah. It's like what." Holy fuck. And then like, it I was, was just like throwing out an idea it's about maybe this thing it's being around. Man, it's just math. <laughs> yeah. And then it evolved to You're Oh, exactly you exactly right, man. Yeah, you believe the earth isn't the center of the universe? You're wrong. Now you're going to die. Your head. You're on yeah. fire. Off with you. burn this fucking Wiccan. Burn this witch. <laughs> yeah. Or what, what do yeah, they call man. what do they call a male witch? What is it? A, a, a warlock, <laughs> right? Or something. It's like burn this motherfucker. He thinks the world is round. And now if you think the now now you th- if you think the world is flat, you're gonna get crucified in social media. But it's like 
everybody, this is the beauty of this fucking place, man. Everybody's kind of entitled. Yeah. You're entitled to just like, you believe this, I believe that. You do. You. As long as you're not yeah. fucking kids, I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah. yes. I mean, that's about yeah. where I draw the line, right? Where it's like, man. It's a pretty big line. It's a pretty big line. Like, keep your fucking hands off kids. Don't hurt anybody else. Like, you can do a lot of cool shit. That's it. I think pedophile yeah. should be executed in the fucking streets. That's the way I think. That's me. That's the only way. Like yep. at that point, I'm like, hey man, you want to smoke pot, believe in Satan, fucking do a bunch of other random mm-hmm. ass shit. Cool. Touch a kid. Let's have public hangings. You that, know what I mean? That's, like, that's really that's interesting. That's about where yep. it goes. Uh, and I'm I'm interested in why, and uh, I'm flipping this thing podcast. <laughs> yeah. My bad, dude. <laughs> I, I got a lot of questions. I mean, I respect you because of what you've done. <laughs> I mean, I can, you're you're obviously a very intelligent and successful man. Why that line? Like, why? What? What? What created that line? Well, I think it's a it's it, it's a very def- definable line where people have this set of priorities, right? So it's really it's it's really just a conversation point in the sense of there are real things that impact and hurt people and have mm-hmm. substantial second and third or third order effects forever, forever yeah. right so when you hurt other people when it's a physical form right when you hurt somebody when you kill a family member when you break a law and i think that is probably one of the most heinous acts that the the, the humans can actually you know perform perform however we want to like put that that into definition but meanwhile a national conversation is taking place where we're talking about people that are they're they're not violent criminals and they're talking about pursuing them you know the war on drugs right mm-hmm. so the war on drugs we're going to put people in jail for you know dealing marijuana and we're going to we're going to pursue these people to the ends of earth because they they imported cocaine from Colombia and it's like Okay, but where's Delta Force and my task force that's pursuing people on the dark web? Yeah, where are those people? Why are we not just as pissed off and up in arms over these things that are happening like right under our nose? And really, where I made that big shift was a few years ago, I was exposed to these guys or Operation Underground Railroad, Mm -hmm. and they started talking because that's what they do. They go to foreign countries and they expose these guys. I've researched that, yeah. yeah. I had no idea, and it still gives me chills today, that there was that much evil on the planet. And it maybe, you know, because I've lived a relatively sheltered life, I guess, when you could say that, you know, we've been pursuing bad people our entire adult lives, but this is fucking bad. That's bad. When you look at dudes that are like building bombs, I'm not, I'm, I'm not justifying bomb builders, no, but I'm saying like there are motherfucking middle. guys that need to die, right? Yep. There are people that we need to pursue and put bullets in. There are legitimate fucking people. But where are we doing? There, and I think it's just a hierarchy of priorities, right? I feel the same yeah. way about the drunk driver that killed my cousin. That was my best friend, though. Right. So that's why I ask you why that line, you know, and and you talk about second, third order effects where you're actually hurting human beings. Correct. The dude that decided to get drunk and killed my cousin mm-hmm. that was one of the best men I knew in my life. Like, I have a freaking problem with that. That yeah, guy oh, needs yeah. to die just as bad as, you know, that's why I asked you mm-hmm. about that line. It, it's, it's interesting, man. And, you know, that, that's, the thing, that's, that's the thing for me, man. It's, it's, why, it's why I'm so passionate about the principles of the Bible. Because the lines are clearly drawn. Mm -hmm. And my opinion doesn't matter. Like, that line is not mine. I have a set of standards. I have a set of morals. They're laid out before me. And they cannot change. And they will not change. And, you know, it's, man, it's a... You got my mind turning, brother. <laughs> you got my mind turning so hard, man. I love it. It's the best podcast I've ever done. This is awesome. <laughs> there was one story that came out on the river one year with one of the guys that was a part of Operation Underground Railroad, and it like it it forever like it freaked me out. It, it fucking freaks you out, man. It was. Guys about Shasha about that. Fuck. Yeah, there was this. Uh, he told us about one in particular, and it was uh, a situation in like a Sam's Club 
Costco, Walmart, or whatever. Costco. Yeah, Costco. Yeah. And this woman was there with her young daughter and, you know, just got separated. Happens Happens, happens every day. And yep. uh, by the time that she contacted one of the employees uh, and, and got them to basically shut down the store, um, someone had grabbed her child, shaved their head, mm. and changed, changed their clothes. Their clothes and it was a, a snap of the fingers. And like when you think about that, you said it, it's like there is pure evil that exists. And and that's like for me super easy to see that hard line to where it's like those people need to go away forever. But that's yeah. that's your opinion though. I mean, mm-hmm. in, in all reality, yeah. that's literally sure. because why why is the guy that takes why do you value a the, I mean, my cousin was innocent. Mm-hmm. That yeah. child is also innocent, right? Why do you value the child's life more than his? They were both taken out from under them in an evil way, um, and neither one of them deserved it, nor did they see it coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why it's blurred for me. You know what I mean? It's blurred. I agree with you. I, I want to agree with you so bad that that should be the line, children. That should be the line. Like yeah. Because I'm very passionate about that same thing. Like, But, but it's just such a blurry line when it's up to you to put a value on evil, you know, when it's up to you to put a to put a hierarchy on it, okay? Why is it is is evil just? Is it not just evil? Is it not just all bad? Um, obviously, the repercussions of certain types of evil in the world are better or worse. But when you're talking about loss of life, mm. why? What? I mean, how can you put more value on a on a life? Yeah, it's not that I'm. I'm- putting any more value just speaking to that like that that specific story had such an impact on me personally that like i it, it kind of changed the way i thought yeah after that you know or, or made it more aware of, of what other people are willing to do yeah it, it made me it, it it opened my eyes you know and if you guys out there have have ever done any research on our it's a it's a fucking incredible organization they yes, do a is. great they do great things. And I think, and I don't, I, I'm not weighing one more than the other. I think there's a much more premeditative, uh, intentional set of evil that in one, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And then the opportunity to do it over and over again on a cycle that creates an amount of destruction on a much more um, exponential level. Mm-hmm. And, and then, as you as you look at you know this is a strange complex conversation but as you look at <laughs> predator, deep, brother. predators predators that that are you know intentionally causing harm to children do that in such a a wide i, I should say wide capacity that the reason that i think that i would weigh that is not that drunk driving isn't like it is it's a fucking. It's, it's a very intentional thing. Uh, but habitual drunk driving murder. Typically, it's like that person gets put in jail. I would imagine they were put in jail for an extended period of time. They were no, they weren't. They're just out. Yeah. But to go back to my thought on that is just like this is something that happens to multiple children, and then that reverberates through those children's children's lives. It's eternal. And it, I mean, it's, the, the doctor it, for the U.S. gymnastics team, yeah. right? They got put away? What, yeah. Uh, Nick, whatever his name was, it doesn't matter. Hundreds. 513 is the number I'm coming up with. Hundreds. 500 and, that's how many women they think he molested. And it's... So when I look at it, uh, and I... That's it, insane. It, it, I'm not causing any differentiation yeah. between harm. I'm just no. saying... When you're causing harm to other people, there's a very strict and hard fucking line where there has to be, there has to be a judgment passed at that point. You know, nobody will be able to articulate to me how dealing fucking marijuana is causing massive amounts of fucking harm mm-hmm. to multiple generations of people. It's just, it's not possible for them to convince me otherwise. You know, it's just not possible for me to even think that, you know, 
I know people say, you know, crack cocaine and cocaine and importation of cocaine. I'm like, yeah, but if people didn't do cocaine, there wouldn't be a need for people to fucking import it on the black market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's a, there's a laundry list and a litany of things that go into that whole conversation with this war on drugs and our taxpayer dollars and a fucking wide variety of conversations that I don't know if we have time for, but it's like (laughs) when I'm prioritizing evil, I put that out there and go, man, I really wish we would pay attention to this and pursue people to the end of earth and fucking try to eliminate this from our society. Yeah. Like if we could, we could try to do that, you know, like, man, we, we just tried to eliminate fucking COVID or whatever the fuck it is. And we had the international community, you know, trying to do this. And it's like, yeah, but what about the dude that is like, importing fucking children and it's moving crazy, them across yeah, the fucking board and yep. doing it to the tunes yeah, of thousands of people every month. every month. Like, what about those guys? Shouldn't we be fucking, Chasing maybe we down. could take our masks off and fucking kill those guys. What do you think? Was that, can we do that one? I can get behind that. Right? So w- give me the president that's going to run on that platform. I don't know much about politics, but let's go kill better asses. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good to me. <laughs> fucking yeah. hey, Got my vote. Let's go. <laughs> You're elected. <laughs> yeah, we, we would go back to work real quick, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, I'd be signed me up. You know, Evan, I love I love this man. And you know, the the whole you know, the whole marijuana conversation is interesting. You've brought it up a few times. Um it's like you know, you 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 talk about when you just said you're like, there's no way that you can convince me that you know, this is causing a long-term impact on families or society, maybe. Those weren't your exact words. Um, good I don't want to yeah. quote you, but, you know, so my that, that, that standard that I have, it calls me to be sober. Um, it says, be sober. Right. Specifically, it calls me out to be sober. Why does it ask me to be sober? Because for me to be a, a productive person, like member of society, for me to be the best that I can possibly be, I I have to be sober. Like there's no question about that. Like I'm performing at my best when I am sober. I believe every human being uh, that's, uh, that's performing at a high, high level needs to be sober when they're performing that task at that high, high level, right? I live my life on a high level. So that's the reason I'm so passionate about being sober. You know, but you look at something like marijuana and you're like, really, you've got this massive portion of our population and, and, you know, they're high all the time. They're high a lot of the time. Um, are they really, are they really being as productive? In American society, if are they being as productive citizens as they could possibly be? Are you getting every ounce out of those people? So what is really, what is the effect? You, you, you could not convince me that legalizing a drug that makes another human being high or drunk or whatever it is, is not detracting from society. Now, should we go to war against marijuana? Freaking dude, you have you only have a certain amount of energy. You only have a certain amount of resources. So no, probably not, man. Prioritization of resources. Exactly. But it is detracting from the capabilities of American citizens and the productivity of an entire freaking massive part of our population. That's my take on it. You know? Well, and I don't know. I mean, I think it'd be hard for me to even try to put the data on that where I think I think that the, the premise of my my points were yeah, to to what to what you were mentioning earlier was the government should only be active in a certain amount of things. Yes, right? sir. Yep. And I think the less government we have, typically the better government we have, right? The smaller the government is, the better the government is. And when we start asking and forfeiting, like that's a slippery, dangerous slope. And we saw it at 9-11, right? Because when we look at the post 9-11, the information uh, collection apparatus that went into play and what happened, I think, after after 9-11 with this, the ability for, I mean, any one of us at any point in time 
could get scooped up in a fucking black van and there doesn't have to be any rights read to us. Yeah. The government just has to say, you're a fucking terrorist and they can put us in a dark hole in the middle of a prison where nobody knows where the fuck we are in and country. in another fucking country and we don't get a phone call, we don't get shit. To me, that's kind of bypassing the entire fucking way mm -hmm. of the American life regardless, right? There's due process. There's a fucking system in place. There's no way you, that somebody can convince me that we should be able to go in and listen and look at everybody's phone, everybody's computer at any point in time without fucking search warrants, without justifiable cause. You know, there's just no... Really, I just I can't be convinced of it. And I've listened to the conversations on both sides, and I've I've said multiple times, man, we've had this opportunity to maintain our freedom. We've had this opportunity every two to four years. We can vote these motherfuckers out. We can vote them out, put yeah. new people in, and the American public keep voting to go take more shit from me, <laughs> give yeah. give the Make government more responsibility because they want to be told what to do. They want to be told. What to do? Yeah, it's well, easier that way. Yeah, how, how easy is it? It's it's I, easy. It's it's you it's, don't have to think. You, you don't, don't have, have to, to create like Travis creating it. You don't have to organize a a freaking event like you guys had the other the other weekend. Like just helping these people on the 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 impact you guys made is again that's another one of those eternal impacts. You guys may not realize it. I hope you do. But that weekend. You made multiple eternal impacts. Um, but if somebody just tells you what to do and gives you a handout, you don't have to put in the work to to create that stuff. So, Well, that's a good three hours. That's a good fucking solid three yeah. hours. We did it. Holy I smokes, love it, man. Dude. We fucking smoked that thing. <laughs> That's that, like, that was a good was a conversation, good guys. Thank yeah. you, guys, mm -hmm. man. Hey, I, where I can got everybody a lot find out of that. you? Where can everybody find yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. So I'm on Instagram at Chad Wright two seven eight. Um, our website is three of seven project dot com. That's the number three of the number seven project dot com. And uh, yeah, that's about it, man. Chad, uh, thanks, man. Thank it was an you, epic guys, show, dude. Man. Appreciate it. God bless America. Amen, that's brother. Right. Amen.